This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Impact Tactical. Impact is a tactical outfitter for the men and women of our military, police, fire departments, and other public safety around the country. Impact's core beliefs is that fearless men and women protect our freedom and safety, should have access to the best tactical performance apparel, equipment, and tools on the market. And they shouldn't have to go broke to get it. I've used Impact for about 11 years, and I can attest that they do live up to their core values. So you get a personal recommendation from me. You can find them at impacttactical.com. That's M-P-A-K tactical.com. And be sure to tell them that two cops, one donut sent you. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HRH Combat Arms. They can turn your vision into reality. They specialize in gunsmithing and Cerakoting. Your Cerakote specialist is Air Force veteran and retired police sergeant Paul Ware, a.k.a. the Sarge. He can Cerakote your firearms, auto parts, tools, even your sports equipment. This veteran-owned business is located at 5025 Saunders Suite, 103, Fort Worth, Texas, 76119. You can call them at 682-304-0363, and you can find them online at www.hrhcombatarms.com. That's www.hrhcombatarms.com. All right, welcome back to Cops One Donut. I am your host, Eric Levine, and today I am, I guess I'm co-casting today. I've got a new uh, friend or two here that both have their own podcast called Left of Greg Podcast. I have uh, Mr. Greg Williams and Brian Marin. How you doing, guys? Hey, good. Doing well. Thanks for uh, having us on. Appreciate it. Not a problem. Not a problem. Um, so today's podcast, if this is going to be an episode uh, our TCOD members are interested in, um, is going to be behavior specialist. Um, we're going to get into um, these guys' backgrounds as far as uh, they got a law enforcement background. We got a military background. Um, Greg's background is really interesting as far as the behavioral specialist. Is that is that correct, Greg? That's close enough. That's that's got to work for now. <laughs> okay. We'll dig, you know, we'll dig deeper. That's a, a great way to describe it, Eric. Okay. That'll work for me. Um, and I can't wait to dig into that part. Uh, and it's just so I can separate the two. Um, Greg, he is our behavior guy. And then um, popping the links up there for anybody listening. Um, and then our host is Brian Marin. So, so good looks. Intelligence? Is that, is that how we separate the two? Absolutely. I am the good looks, That's, and Brian is yep. the intellectual the intelligence one. one. You've got yeah. it. All right. Nailed I'm, it. I'm really happy with the sound, by the way, guys. Um, this is the first time for my my members listening um, that I've had two guests on using this live stream thing, restream, that I use. So right now, you guys talked over each other, but I could hear both of you at the same time. So that is beautiful. That's good. I'm always learning. Always learning. So, <laughs> all right. First, um uh, age before beauty. I'm going to go that route. So Greg, um, give me a little bit of your background. Where are you from? Which education level? How, what led you into a life of service? That's cool. I appreciate that, Eric. And uh, huge fan of the show. Thankfully, we're on the show. Uh, it's a great transformation from being uh, listeners to being guests. Uh, so born and raised in Detroit, uh, spent uh, uh, time in the military, uh, U.S. Army, the real military, not the Air Force. Well, you were trying. You were trying. So, you know what? I'm not going to say anything bad. Exactly. And uh, uh, respect you for your service. Thanks for that. Uh, what happened uh, during the military is I found out that my life on the uh, streets of metropolitan Detroit and my military service uh, created a nexus of, uh, of intellectual curiosity in the field of human behavior pattern recognition analysis. Uh, nobody had that. At that time, I read up on uh, uh, things that were published by uh, Dr. Marty Seligman and and a bunch of other uh, uh, brilliant uh, people, uh, Gary Klein, uh, back in the day. And I said, I can do better because I'm out on the streets and they're in an academic setting. Uh, so what I did is I conducted my own uh, street view research and training. And when I came back to the metropolitan Detroit area, there were only three jobs available during that period of my life. One was hood. Uh, one was cop, and then one was working for General Motors. So uh, two of those didn't appeal to me. I had already done the hood route, and I didn't want to make a car. So I became a copper on the street. I uh, spent uh, 27 years in all facets of police work, uh, uh, from undercover operations to SWAT to homicide investigations to being 
uh, everything from a, a under sheriff to the deputy chief of police to the uh, interim chief of police. So I've I've got a little bit of experience when it comes to law enforcement in an agency where you could actually spread it around. Uh, also worked for task force and OSADEF, so had uh, operations that were outside of the metropolitan Detroit area, uh, including uh, cop work in Colorado and uh, other uh, areas uh, <laughs> that shall remain nameless, but they'll know me as soon as they see me. Um, and uh, the idea was that all of these things started to coalesce, that there was certain human behavior <laughs> patterns that repeated themselves over and over. And if you understood them, and if you could read the tea leaves correctly, you would be able to detect uh, early uh, signals of uh, opportunity or danger in any environment, no matter where you were. So it doesn't matter if you're walking in the 7-Eleven, if you're about to talk to your kids, if you're meeting uh, your future significant other for the first time, uh, all uh, human beings uh, reacted the same way to a certain set of factors. And so if uh, you put the cues together, in a logical way, artifacts and evidence, they would support the reasonable conclusion. I've been doing that my uh, entire life now. Uh, I'll be 60 in a couple of days, and I've been doing this for you know just under 50 of those 60 years, and uh, I absolutely love it. Along the way, very briefly, I met uh, Marine Scout Sniper Brian Marin in uh, some of the worst places on the face of the planet, outside the wire in Iraq, outside the wire in Afghanistan, and literally we kept running into each other, and uh, I'm the big buffoon. I'm not... Uh, ever scared because I don't understand the situation. And so I keep running into this guy with the little black skateboard and helmet and his little M4. And after a while, I was like, hey, this guy's really wicked smart, and he's clearly an operator. And I said, Brian, wh- why do we keep bumping into each other? Why don't we work together? And we've been working together ever since. Oh, that's awesome. So you came from Detroit originally. That's true. I'm from Flint. Um, yeah, I know. I know in the Saginaw connection, Eric, I love your Saginaw connection because every time I listen to Bob Seeger, another Detroit boy, uh, uh, yep. I love hearing uh, about him driving through Saginaw. And uh, we share uh, in Flint, uh, there was a, a great uh, sniper team commander uh, that came out of that area. And I taught defensive tactics at Oakland and officer survival at the academy there. So, I mean, our paths yeah. ran together. It's just I'm like 100 years older than <laughs> You got me by 20, almost 20. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's not too bad. Yeah, I, um, I'm i very uh, interested to, to hear more. Now, were you a PD in in Detroit? Are you no, no, talk- in, in uh, metropolitan Detroit. So uh, okay. it's Warren PD, which is the third largest city in Michigan. And uh, I my beat was uh, six square miles that bordered Detroit. It was a nice area. It was, uh, it was a <laughs> yeah. great place to conduct uh, uh, experiments every night. Yes. That was the beauty of it. I worked midnights for 11 years, and uh, I could conduct my uh, sociological and psychological experiments every single night. Yeah. I, man, it's it, it's interesting that you, you, you put it the way you did. Um, I always found myself doing similar. I, I, I worked midnights for 10 years um, before I finally switched. I, I just, I loved it. And, you know, one, nobody else was around, like your higher ups aren't around. So you get to actually go do police work without somebody breathing over your shoulder and stuff like that. Right. But that is, that is fascinating on that. And so you were army. Were you, That's true. what was your MOS in the army? Well, uh, just like everybody else that starts the Army, I was 11 Bravo first. Uh, there's nothing wrong with infantry. That's where everything starts and ends. Uh, the good thing is that I had a number of uh, – I had a pretty high ASVAB. I had a bunch of experiences uh, before the Army that gave me a, sort of an opportunity, a panacea of opportunities to get into some uh, uh, special operations units uh, as a member of the sort of an adjunct. You know what task forces are. So yeah. I was nice enough uh, – uh, uh, they were nice enough to pick me up. Uh, as a member of a task force, and I learned a ton. I, I had probably the best tours that anybody could ever get because they opened doors and gave me opportunities I would have never had as a, yeah. a standard U.S. Army soldier. I just, I actually just got back from Detroit. Um, we had, I'm a part of a nonprofit organization called Brotherhood for the Fallen. And oh, the, great. the basic premise for Brotherhood for the Fallen is um, any department can have its own chapter or any city, however you want to do it. Um, and you basically are donating a portion of your paycheck each week um, or biweekly, however you do it, towards the brotherhood. And what that does is it pulls that money together throughout the year. And every time an officer falls in the line of duty, we take a portion of that money that we saved up. It's used for the travel of the officers 
and uh, a check is given to the family for the fallen officer to use however they choose, um, you know, for funeral costs or whatever it is, sure. because we know how how deep that um, hole can go financially, because now you got an officer that can't, he, he's gone, he can't work part time, can't do any, you know, insurance is nice, everybody's like, cops have insurance, they should be fine. It, it ain't enough. Uh, nothing replaces your loved one that you lost uh, for the fallen hero. But what I really like is the fact that we come out, we represent from another department, other chapters we meet together. So right. we, we had New York, Boston, uh, Chicago, other parts of New York, Suffolk. Um, we had all these groups. We met. We all stayed at the same hotel together. And then we all presented together um, kind of like a united front. And it just blows the doors off of the family because they don't expect it. Um, they've already got an overwhelming support that they don't even know what to do with yet you know with their local pd um and then here we come and it's just i like that 100 percent of the money goes to 100 percent of the cause it's hard uh, to that's find wonderful thanks for doing that Eric. Yeah. really so yeah i just got back from detroit for fallen officer lauren quartz um prayers to his yep. family uh in case everybody listening. knew his dad too so what what a what a legacy in detroit yeah and, dad, uh, sorely missed dad retired from, there. from detroit uh beautiful funeral Great, great things were said. So um, that was my first time participating. Like I, I could travel to any state, but that was my home state. So I felt like I right. had more of a connection. Um, the other officer from my department also was from uh, Michigan, Lansing area. And then um, Dallas sent some officers and one of their officers was from Flint. So we had the Flint That's connection. Amazing. Yeah, it was very cool. So um yeah so i was just in detroit got to do that got to see a lot of detroit pd some of the things see the differences between um as, as we talk about behavior uh you know it doesn't matter what metropolitan area you go to you start to see the same pattern of behavior when it comes to homeless mental illness uh just uh, just all Absolutely sorts of true. things and you know what i like to call the spidey senses when you start to see s certain behaviors like yeah this ain't a good so let's go this way <laughs> i don't want to deal with that i'm off duty so um sorry brian i want to get to you now sir can you kind of go down the same line i we got going on a tangent here you start bringing up detroit and family memories and stuff started going no i i, I get it so i grew up in the midwest i grew up in, on the south side of chicago and uh we grew up there um and then eventually uh Went to a couple different high schools. <laughs> I tried, ah, I'm seeing tried, a pattern here. Tried. That's tried why he went college, to the Marines. <laughs> tried college for a little bit. 9/11 happened. I said, "Well, I know what I want to do." And so, uh, yeah, no, I, I in, enlisted in the Marine Corps. Um, uh, did several deployments in the Marine Corps. Became a sniper, um, and was a sniper team leader. Uh, kept like, a, and then you know worked for the Marine Corps for a while as well. After that, uh, especially at a at a training facility, actually. Uh, where I first kind of ran into Greg, uh, I like this story he was telling when Greg was implementing the um, the Combat Hunter program to the Marine Corps, which he was one of the architects of. He, he wrote all the human behavior portion of that program. And so I ran into him there, first saw him talk, was briefing people. I was at this training facility where, you know, you were supposed to, uh, a Marine's first firefight was supposed to be no worse than their last training evolution and that's what this this uh general mattis wanted this facility built for how do we do a completely interactive um you know uh, a, a training facility that can develop some sort of stress inoculation let's get the big brain phd scientists in here let's study let's figure out what works with training and what doesn't and so i was fortunate enough by chance luck whatever you want to call it to be a part of that at a tactical level of bringing those marines through and advising them you know i had just gotten back from deployment as well i was like hey this is how you can operate this is what a decision making under stress this is how you implement training procedures to actually enhance that what is it that that works and what doesn't and so ran into greg there greg was talking the, this was when the combat hunter program was I, I, still being implemented it wasn't even full scale yet it was still at a smaller scale and they were testing it and evaluating to see if they wanted it to go marine corps wide which of course it eventually did for for probably decades after um but you know i saw him talk and i took a page of notes and said this guy's this guy's full of shit and i'm gonna fucking <laughs> i'm gonna go research all this shit he was talking about and i was like yeah kind of hard to poke holes in what he's saying here um, and then we kind of ran into each other there, sort of worked uh, under, worked together on this larger overarching program called 
fight JCTD, future immersive training environment, joint capabilities, technology demonstration, big old DARPA U.S. government project. That's where we kind of first met. And then again, like you said, years later, we ran into each other, kept running into each other on and off for the next few years. I think finally in Afghanistan and 2012, I was uh, doing security work for different government agencies at the time for a while and uh, ran into him there and then, you know, finished up that rotation and basically started working for him in 2013. And now together, after we started our, our own company uh, a few years back. Very nice. So what what's the company? I'm just curious. Uh, so we're, our company is called Arcadia Cognorati. And that's where, you know, we took the the elements of what, what Greg ha- has um you know, written uh, is starting decades ago and, and continued that forward today. So if anyone's heard of like that Marine Corps combat hunter program, I always make the joke like, Hey, that combat hunter program was like, that's like the iPhone one. I mean, if you've never seen the iPhone before, it's, it's cool. It's amazing. amazing. (laughs) But, but we're, we're building, we're building the, you know, the 15 now, right? We're working on 13, but we're already in, in building the 15. So we've taken those concepts and moved them, uh, even light years ahead from from what it was then, which was already a phenomenal program back then. So, um, yeah, that's what we do together. Is we have a train. It's a training and consulting firm. So we work. We partner with other companies for different stuff. We do a lot of training. Uh, law enforcement, first responders, private sector, military. Uh, we, we're fortunate enough that our system and our process works no matter where it's at in the world and no matter what the problem is. We train people how to identify you know danger and opportunity in in any environment because those can kind of look similar, and we stick to those basic tenets of, of human behavior pattern recognition analysis uh, that have been, you know, our program's been poked and prodded by every government research organization that your tax dollars go to. And they not only said, yeah, this is legit. They said, this is highly effective. And so we stick to the science. And so we, we made the joke, you know, Greg wrote the, the army's uh, version of combat hunter was called ASAP advanced situational awareness training. And, um, you know, we always make the joke as instructors, it's ASAT stood for all science all the time. We stick to the science and stick to what you can prove, artifacts and evidence in support of a reasonable conclusion. And that's what you go with. And so we train people how to do that. So specifically, like for guys and girls like you, Eric, like law enforcement, you know, we get people that are like, you know, the old sage gray beards are going, where the hell has this been my whole career? Uh, I've got three decades of experience, but I don't know how to articulate it the way you do. So you gain a lot of tacit knowledge. So even when I go train a SEAL team, I'm like, hey, I'm going to be here for the next five days. I'm going to teach you a bunch of stuff you already know how to do. And they're like, okay. And I was like, yeah, just no one ever explained it to you. And so then once we get into to, to that, it's like that light bulb moment goes on and you immediately have all of this experience to draw from. So all we have to do is prime you, get you to use the right words, show you how to do it, and then you get to go, holy crap, I already know how to do this. I've been doing this my whole life. No yeah. one ever flipped a switch on for me. No one ever gave me the words to experience it. Even you just said, like, oh, that hanky button's going off. Everyone likes to say that stuff. Or, hey, that guy's acting shady. My response is always, well, he's standing underneath the tree. It's 120 degrees out. He's in the shade, of course. Is that what you mean? And they're like, no, when he's acting shady. I'm like, what does that mean? And yeah. no one can explain yeah, what that you means. Can't, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we all know what it is when you see it, right? Yeah. So, so that, that's just an example of kind of what we do. And, and, you know, again, we get to work in all kinds of different areas and we get to work around some amazing, amazing people and really, really smart, intelligent folks. And, and so it's, it's a fun, fun job. I'm very excited about this because with the people I work with, I'm the nerd. Like, that's just how they look at me. I, I'm the guy that's constantly, um, I look at our training and I look for holes, constantly i can't help it it's just it's my superpower as far (laughs) as it goes right um so i'm constantly looking for holes and stuff like that and um without knowing specifically what your training is or anything like that and it's full disclosure guys i've i've only looked into them a little bit i saw there a few things on their podcast which i'm going to show some highlights and stuff that i just thought just listening to greg talk immediately goes he's got to be law enforcement like his shit is just like, just the way he talks, I can tell. Um, and, and the way he talks uh, or what he's talking about, I agree with, and I, that's coming from experience. So, um, I already wanted to have you on just based on that alone. Um, and with that hearing about the, the behavioral science and all of that, um, it reminds me a lot of when I first heard about emotional intelligence, I started right. learning about emotional intelligence and I was like, the hell is this hippy dippy stuff um and i started to dive into it a little bit more and realize like yeah okay maybe i don't agree with uh 
the title emotional intelligence, but when I found out more about it and how I work as a leader and, and, and facilitate, you know, people under me and crews and stuff like that. And then how all this martial arts training I've had throughout my life, I'm big into jujitsu, I've done judo, all this stuff. I'm the guy that never gets in use as a force. Why is right. that? And it goes into this emotional intelligence side when I started learning about people and, and patterns of behavior and stuff like that and trying to use that to old school verbal judo my way out of any problems. So I like I like that aspect of it. And if I can start taking some behavioral things, um, like when I'm tra- – I used to be a trainer. So – and this is for citizens that listen to this podcast. Um, there's fight indicators you're not going to see on camera. Clenched jaw, fist pumping, um, these little Spot things, on. slightly bladed stance. They're trying to, uh, eyes looking around, like, why the hell are they looking around? Oh, they're looking for an escape route. Or they're looking for witnesses if they decide to take me. Um, the way they look you up and down. Like, those are all indicators I use as a cop. And like you said, articulation is the important part. If I get into use of force, I've already got all this stuff broken down because, well, mm-hmm. you know, you did, officer, you just punched him. And in the citizens listening to the show is what I want you to understand. I don't have to wait to be hit. I have these physical things that I'm looking for, these indicators um, that a lot of people don't look for. He started clenching his jaw. His, you know, his right foot took a you know, back stance. Most people are right-handed. You know, he started blading his fit or balling his fist up a little bit. I could see that he was becoming stressed. Like all of these indicators. So if you start to learn to articulate, yep. um, they really help you, one, in your use of force, and two, I want citizens to understand these are the things that I, as an officer, am looking into when I decide to use force. And if I can help, like I said, this is the education side education side of the show, is these are details that citizens just do not get. They don't hear this stuff. So this, you know, Brian is an outside source. He is not police. He was military. So you've got a totally different facet here. And then, Greg, you were both. So we're kind of hitting all angles when it comes to use of force because your guys' rules of engagement were 10 times more stringent than what we have here on stateside now. Um, I don't That's know. absolutely true, Eric. So so let's let's do this, Eric. Let's take a trip back in time. The, right. the reason we called our company Arcadia Cognorati is that, uh, you know, uh, most people that are on the call today, there's always some classic obstructionists and they can kiss my ass, but most people that are on the call today will think back to the Greeks. Very old, very Greek means very smart. And they had a lot going on. And what they did is they either adopted or forwarded uh, uh, the best of science at their time. And one of the things that they knew is that the word for crisis was made up of two words, danger and opportunity. Let's fast forward to feudal Japan. Uh, They had two characters that they used, one for danger, one for opportunity. The word came together and it meant crisis. Uh, Chinese, uh, as far back as you can uh, uh, see China behind the veil, uh, they used two completely and distinctly different characters and danger and opportunity came together to form their word for crisis. Now we could sit there and we could just beat that up or we could go to the mat. So if you bleed on the mat rather than on the street, that's good training. But the problem was that all my questions weren't answered in the dojo. So I know that you're a Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu uh, uh, person. Uh, Brian's an Aikido person. All of us have different disciplines that we've studied through use of force through our various agencies. And here's the thing. At bang, it's still a crapshoot. So what did you have to do? A martial artist on the mat had a roll the dial back, and, and I developed a term called uh, left of bang. That's the joke about the left of Greg podcast because now everybody's co-opted it and there's left of boom and everything else. But I was the originator of that term because the idea was bang can be anything. It can be a flat tire or a guy sticking a gun in your nose and saying give up the cheese. The idea is that's too late to train and make your decision. It's too late when the siren for the tornado to go out to look at your wife and kids or your husband and your kids and say, what do we do? Outside, basement, hallway, where are we going? So on the mat, what I learned is a great uh, uh, philosophizer, Miyamoto Musashi, uh, uh, the book of five rings. He said, you win or lose before you ever fight the battle. I was like, okay, yeah, it's good rhetoric. I mean, it's like everybody now hanging some sign in the room that's somebody else's famous quote. What did you mean by it? Well, what he meant by it is the art of the empty self. Karate doesn't mean empty hand. It means the empty self. It means you've got to be a tabula rasa. You've got to be a white slate, and you have to take a look at the environment and say, what is this environment telling me? Well, if I'm only doing that in the octagon, the only cues I'm going to get are about the fight that's at hand. So I got I to gotta roll that tape backwards, and I got to go to that fighter and say, where was he born? 
and, and who were his mentors? And what did he eat for dinner yesterday? And where did he go to the movie last week? You would be surprised at how many humans don't understand that you can predict danger or opportunity by looking in your environment and seeing the cues. If you're talking to somebody at the PTA and you smell alcohol or reefer on them, guess what? That might mean that it's going to spin wildly out of control when you say your opinion about politics or religion to that person. If you're going into a bar and I accidentally walk into you and spill your drink, that could spin out of control and be a homicide in, in a few minutes. Or the, the Chicago copper uh, uh, and, and former soldier that got paralyzed uh, uh, you know, outside of Beverly. You know, This is ridiculous shit that happens, but almost everything is predictable. And I will tell you the hard answers, like school shootings, they're 100% predictable. Brian and I have done a tremendous amount of research. We've worked in 53 different countries. We worked for the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, for all of our coalition partners and every tip of the spear agency in the United States, USDOG, uh, DOJ and USDOD, meaning all tip of the spear. And the number one thing that we tell them all the time is that everything is predictable. Now, you might walk out of your house one day and turn left instead of right and get hit by an asteroid. Or, or you sit up too high to, to talk to your partner and you get zipped by a round that was intended for somebody else. Those things happen, okay? It's string theory, fractal rabbits. But the idea is almost everything that happens to your life is going to be predictable. And every school shooting that we've investigated, all the people that we've interviewed always said the same thing. And mine started back in Columbine. That's how far I can date back to school shootings. And, and at Columbine, I was teaching, before Columbine happened, I was teaching people about Andrew Kehoe, K-E-H-O-E. Folks, look that one up on your own. Do your homework. The idea was that even at Columbine, there were all these predictive indicators, every single school shooting since, and, and it will be in the future because they ain't going anywhere. Everybody in that school said, when we asked the question, who do you think is going to turn out to be the school shooter? Him. Okay? And, and so if those cues are strong enough, that means those cues permeated to mom and to dad or significant other or, or mentor or coach and everybody else in the chain of command. We know they do social leakage, right? We know that school shooters uh, uh, advertise and do countdowns. So you're telling me that somebody's out of the loop. Now everybody's in the loop. And the big problem with communication is we rely so much on apps and gosh damn uh, uh, other electronic means of communication that we forgot that the easiest way for a human to read another human is to be in the same room with them. So I know that was a long way around the tent, buddy, but Eric, I'm telling you, everything you learned on the mat in the dojo is how we see the rest of the world because it makes a lot of sense. The idea, though, is I never want to have to put my gi on. I never want to have to go into the dojo. I want to be able to shut the lights off on that situation. I want to be able to, to disarm and psychologically uh, uh, de-escalate that situation before it ever comes to a head. That's our key. That's our goal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly, that's, that's, every, well, we're speaking about law enforcement. I mean, that should always be our goal, you know, and, I it, absolutely and agree. every time we roll the clock back and we, we get to do that hindsight 2020 on somebody's body cam videos, you, me, you know, people that train and, and, and look for these things, you know, that poor zero to five year officer is still yep. learning most of the time. This is a generalization, um, but we look at it, and I'm like, there was your first sign, and it was right when the call started. Like, mm -hmm. look you at it. You got it. Right now. You're like that. Eric, in all your training, think about that. In all of your training, first of all, let's look at SCOTUS. Uh, if we want to look at the U.S. Constitution and case law, case law always comes from some idiot doing some stupid thing that no good cop around the road would ever consider doing. You, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. now we've got that, right? Then the second part is you train. And the problem is training and real life experience, there's a gap. So we shoot four times a year to get all the different weather conditions. Uh, we drive only once in our career, even though as coppers, we're going to drive every day out on the road, right? Yeah. Now, when you get sent back to training on, on uh, driving, uh, you go to charm school when you get in an accident. They send you back, right? The idea is all of police training is flawed because they don't start with human versus human contact and interaction. That's where it is. And that's where you're going to see it. Uh, baby cries. Mom knows she starts lactating. Why? Because it's an electrochemical neurotransmitter signature that all humans possess that link us to other humans. And guess what? If we want to be idiots and not pay attention, if we want to play the ostrich, then we're going to become what they call in science victims. Correct. Yeah. I, so I'm curious what your thought is on, um, when they say, you know, he doesn't possess the social skills. So he's going to, yeah. he's not going to be able to pick up on these indicators. Are you telling me that 
through your system of training and stuff like that, we can help those socially awkward, uh, stereotypical homeschooled officers that are out there. Yes, and it's not just the officers. It's the 7-Eleven clerk. It's the librarian. It's the person that works at the homeless shelter. It's the homeless person on the street. If you can anticipate danger, you can mitigate it. If you can anticipate opportunity, you can be there and avail yourself of opportunity. And people go, what do you mean danger and opportunity? They're so damn close that when you see them, you're not going to know which it is right away. Uh, uh, we had the kid in the food court that uh, uh, one, one half of America is calling him a good Samaritan. The other half of America is calling him a vigilante. And then the, the, the people that like the kid for stopping the shooting say, hey, eight out of 10 rounds in 15 seconds hit the target. My first question as a trainer, where's those other two rounds? Do you get what I'm trying to say? My yeah. second question there, this guy had a rifle and a shotgun or whatever else, and he walks into this food court. Where do you think he started? Yeah. Did, he, did, you, did he materialize? Did somebody beam him down? We say that all the time. Nobody comes out of nowhere. What happens is we're so used to looking down and in. We're so used to just worrying about ourselves that we don't read the tea leaves of the environment that we're coming into, the sights, the sound, the smell, the feel. And you know what Brian's job was? And, and let me throw this at, at, at you because, Eric, I don't know if your uh, listeners, and you got a vast body of varied listeners, understand what a sniper is. Most people think a sniper splits wigs at 1,000 meters uh, uh, and, and can shoot one minute and have angle shots out to that range. Well, that's great. But, Brian, what's the role of a sniper in a combat zone? Yeah, I mean, your, your primary role is, is going to be surveillance. And, and so, you know, just to talk about what you brought up or how do I, how do I take this tacit knowledge, right, Eric? So you've been in law enforcement for how long? You have a lot of what's called tacit yep. knowledge. Just, 17 years. Uh, and now, there you go. Yeah. So knowledge and experience you've gained over that, that time that it's kind of hard to articulate. It's hard to sum all that up, but you've yeah. gained all that. And then, you know, there's explicit knowledge, which you can read in a book or get taught in a course, and, and that's great. So there's kind of a difference there. And, and, and so the idea is how do you bring all that stuff forward? Because like you said, we all have these experiences that are different. And me alone, we don't, none of us are working with a full deck, right? And so, but if we get yeah. enough of us together, then we have enough cards and we have enough ways to solve the problem. And, and there's no better difference than a uh, perfect example uh, in the Marine Corps. And I, I spent a lot of time in the city of Ramadi in the Al Anbar province of Iraq. And uh, I was a city boy, right? I grew up in Chicago. So, like, I, I like cities. I love being in a city. I love having people around. It's just, it's alive and it's, you know, it's a different experience. Uh, I was fortunate enough when I was growing up, too. My mom's side of the family is all from Wisconsin. They're third generation dairy farmers up there. So, I got to spend a lot of time on a dairy farm growing up. So, I had a little bit of experience outside of a city, you know, but, but not like people who grew up in the country. So, we're in, a hot, we're in our hide site one time. And one of the guys on my team is like, dude, you got to take a look at this guy. He's up to something. Oh, yeah, he's definitely calling something in. He's spotting down there. I'm like, uh, he looks like he's waiting for a ride. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, this guy looks like he's, like, playing with his phone, talking on it, then looking down the street. Like, But to him, since the only thing he knew of someone doing that was, you know, when they were watching to set off an IED when, right. when, a, when a, uh, you know, a, a convoy went by, he just assumed, he, you know, he defaulted to that, where I'm like, yeah, this guy look, looks like he's waiting for a ride. Sure enough, car pulls up, the guy waves, he gets in, and they drive off. Okay, well, he's like, oh, wow, I never really looked at it that way. I'm sitting here ready to, to smoke this guy right now, and, yeah. and he's just waiting for a ride from his buddy. But then once we moved outside the city and we were working in a little rural, rural area outside there, I'm sitting here watching this guy, and, you know, I'm like, okay, like he's, he's farming and, and working on something over here, and then he's doing that, and then not thinking anything of it, and my buddy's going like, dude, are you watching this right now? What the hell is going on? I'm like, what, dude, this dude's just, he's just, like, t tilling his field or something. I don't know, he's a farmer. He's like... This is not farmland, okay? You cannot farm anything right here. Like, you can't grow something where that man is at. He's he's digging up or hiding some sort of cache. And I was like, oh, God, I didn't, I didn't even notice, right? I'm the city boy. Right. So the idea is you have those those perspectives will change based on your experiences. And and so what our process does, what, what our program is really good at is, is building file folders and, and being able to take – uh, get you know taking you putting you into a new novel environment somewhere you haven't been before and you can sense make and problem solve based Absolutely. on your own life experiences you can look at something and go okay I've never seen that before but that's very similar to this oh it's I now understand the situation is likely here it's the gas it's the gas can one too from the from from being deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan people are like hey like this guy's stockpiling gas cans over there like that's a gas station 
watch a car is going to pull up. <laughs> he's going to come out and fill it. Yeah. Does it, does it look like our gas stations? Well, no, not out here, not out here in the sticks, man. You go in downtown in Kabul or Baghdad. Sure. You'll have a normal looking gas station, but out here it's literally a guy at a hut with a bunch of cans of gas. And it was like, Oh, but since we're going through that, you know, you're in the military thinking I'm looking for threats. Yeah. Everything is a potential threat in your environment. Well, no, not everything is. In fact, very th- few things are potential yeah. threats in our environment. It's just and, like and the reason oh, I brought that up, Eric, I, I apologize. The, the reason I brought that up, Brian's so humble, he's not going to say it anyway, but you get most snipers, SEALs, Rangers, Deltas, anybody else in a room. And if they're the wrong, everybody, thank God for your service. I'm not poking you in the eye. But if you get them in a room, the first thing I want to do is tell you their longest shot and how many people they smoke checked on this patrol and all that other stuff. What Brian just laid out for you is the most kinetic environment in Iraq at that time. As a Marine sniper, Marines aren't there to hug. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Uh, the idea is what he did is he told you how he didn't want to kill because those cues weren't there. And that's the idea. The idea is there's so many things in your environment. Look, if you're a copper, you're already scared when you go out there. And coppers right now go, no, I'm not scared. I was a copper 27 years. I was never not scared. And when you go on an unknown trouble and you show up and you can smell the cordite and you see the shell casings and the blood's already on the ground, everybody's butthole tightens. That's the way it works. That's what your your brain is uh, uh, telling you. Get out of there. You don't want to be there. Do you get what I'm saying? And then there's this whole horse shit about the warrior class. Look, you're not trained. Your brain is not trained for how you're going to react to those situations. So either training is like you do, Eric, really good stuff over time, very deliberate, where you do your research and do the science. That's what we do. Or it's your last experience and the trainer. Look, I went to Ferris State University back in 1979. And what it was is, hey, listen, when you go to Ferris State University, what we want you to do is we want you to be a part of this program because you're a black belt in three different martial arts, and we want you to teach these coppers how to fight. Why? I don't know anything about being a cop. I don't understand the context of what role that they're going to be into. But that's what it was like back then. The gun guy was the guy that was the fastest with the gun or the best shot. Uh, uh, the, the guy that taught you the baton was the guy that could mangle you with his baton, and he used the kel light for an enema anytime somebody gave him a, a hard time, right? Well, how much education did, you know, you had an 11-week academy back there, and it was different strangleholds. Then all of a sudden, you got to come out on the street and be a lawyer. And you got to come out on the street and be a sociologist. And you got to come out on the street and, and you know, uh, check rectally for signs of mental illness. The idea was that we were <laughs> ill-prepared for that role. And now the biggest challenge, Eric, is people are coming back from combat and they want to become cops. And guess what they brought with them? You think they brought the best of the military with them? Nah. No, they brought that last hard experience on the road. And, and when, when I hear somebody on the stand and, and, you know, hey, folks, if you need somebody to pick a jury or, or, or to throw out a witness, uh, uh, call. But the idea is they get, yeah, I was looking at that guy and he's giving me that side eye. And I've got this. None of that is true. You get what I'm trying to say for, for anybody that comes on and goes, oh, these are the seven deceit signals of the, you know, 30-year-old white male in Nebraska. It's all horseshit. It's either science or it's not. And you know how you know that? Because case law. Take a look at all the laws where the people didn't have the artifacts and evidence to prove it. What we're saying is just carrying concealed weapon is not going to be like a cross against a vampire. It's not going to save you from shit. And and your ability to, to think that you can roll a tire and do the ropes in your backyard and bench press 500 pounds isn't going to keep you out of danger. Because you know what? That 9 millimeter doesn't give a shit. And it's going to be tearing through you just like anybody else. So the idea is if you want realistic uh, 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 on the ground self-defense, if you want to stop school shootings and you want to stop criminality, you got to teach people to see the cues and put to the breadcrumbs together, uh, you know, put that puzzle together, at least three or more cues in advance of whatever they do before you go to dinner, before you walk into 7-Eleven, before you pull up to get gas. If we did that as a society, we would stop, we would circumvent, we would prevent more crime and more homicides and more danger. Uh, listen, uh, what does a what does a, a shoplifter do? They have to set up the conditions to steal and then run. What does a pedophile have to do? Well, wait a minute, it's the same thing. I got to do the same thing as, as a pedophile. I, I I can't go to the local church to steal a 12 pack of cold bud. So I have to go to the the. Well, how would a pedophile look that? Well, I I might want to be a coach or you know get into student teaching so I can have that you know target population that's in front of me that's the idea so when i met brian and brian had to look for the target population you know what the target population oh cheers by the way you know what the target population was back then eric target population was military aged male 
holy shit. Right. That's, well, first of all, is that illegal? Okay. <laughs> where, where, where's our constitutional scholars on this one? But you know what? You ran, they shot you. If you had a gun, they shot you. If you're military age male, they shot you. Why? Because it was kinetic combat, and that's the way the seesaw was tipped at that point. I came in and said there was a better way. We could save lives on both sides of the camo pattern. We could save lives on both sides of the plate carrier and on both sides of the badge. And you know what? We've been doing it for a wicked long time. I've been doing it my entire career. We know that it works. So why don't people listen to it? Because it's hard. Because you got to yeah. go to school. Yeah. Your training's hard. Your training, Eric, when you're teaching coppers, when you're teaching first responders, sometimes they break their fingers or they rip a part of their uniform and have to go out and buy it out of their pocket or, or they get dinged with a flashlight or sprayed in the eye or tased, you know what I'm saying? And it's not fun and it's hard. But guess what? Everybody that's at the top of their game is out there and they're shooting those free throws night after night after night because they know that sooner or later they're going to be called on and that free throw needs to count. That's right. Um, one of the things I want to point out um, for those listening that are kind of like, you know, well, yeah, okay, I see what he's saying overseas. And one of the hardest parts to do is train young cops, uh, young military members. You train them in these things, and then they get put in, they get put, you know, in, in the situation. They get put in live scenario. You know, it's it's right. real now. They're in, They're on the job. And what do they want to do? Especially when you get them all hyped up. Oh, the east side's the worst side of town. That's the dangerous side of town. Well, now sure. every shadow that moves is a fucking yep. threat. Yep. So you're already... Well, in, you built that into them. You're exactly right. Yes. And in yeah, Michigan, right. where I grew up, we called that the yep. squirrel effect. You go whitetail yep. season, and guess what? Every fucking squirrel that moved was a goddamn 16-point, <laughs> 250-pound <laughs> buck. And, when, you, yep. so that's and guess where you, what you were missing, though, no. Eric? Those, 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 uh, uh, you know, the huge rack, non-tip Boone and Crockett walked <laughs> away because it saw you there, smelled your fart, heard your burp. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You never get close to the, to the real criminals on the street because you're out there in a target rich environment thinking that you got to be the person that's changing the math. And that's not what it is. Sometimes it's sit back, get that 20 ounce double gulp you who from the local 7-Eleven, <laughs> yeah. roll down the windows and shut up and listen. Right. I mean, you know that. And, and Flint's the place that you wanted to listen. What are you hearing? First, I hear the dog bark. Then I hear the car uh, alarm go off. And then I hear the fence shake. Well, I know what's going on. Start heading for that way, right? Yep. And, and turn off the big V8 and get out of the car and walk over there yeah. and, and use your flashlight or smell or hear what is yeah, going stop on. stop and listen. The best coppers in the world know that. Yeah. And, well, the we are, we're, not, we're not training that at the academy. No, and, and and what you're getting into too, Eric, is it's actually you know this is humans are wired for survival. So if you're not tying everything back to survival, you're right. starting to step outside of what becomes scientific, and you're starting to get outside of what's really going to work and help you. And what I mean by that is, you know, we all humans, all of us, everyone on this call, everyone listening right now, we see what we want to see, we hear what we want to hear, and we believe what we want to believe, even if it's absolutely not true. You have to. It's, 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 a, it's a necessity for your survival. Your limbic system is kicking in your brain. It's trying to keep you alive, and it wants to burn as few calories to do it as possible. That's why you, your brain's saying, eat more, uh, uh, sleep more, don't go do this, that's difficult, we're here for survival. So that affects our cognition. That affects our perception of the world. So all of those things you just say, when I start laying that in, well, you know, it's this part of town and then you know what happened. And did you hear what happened over here? Oh, did you hear what this new drug is doing to people? Even if it just gets a little bit on your skin, it's like, wait, wait we're creating the boogeyman here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, guess what? So then when something close enough to the boogeyman shows up, there it is, that's the threat right there. And that's also what the, when, when you see, the, the worst situations where, you know, a uh, police officer gets in a situation where, you know, the guy, he thinks the guy pulls a gun out and it's a cell phone. And, and people yep. are going, how can you do that? He's an idiot. He's a racist. He's this. It's like, this is how human perception works. That police officer saw a gun. And people are like, well, no, it was a cell phone. Like, you don't understand how your brain will fill in information, and that's what you think you'll see. But yet everyone will say, yeah, oh, eyewitnesses, they're the worst, right? You know that as a cop, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, the eyewitness testimony is terrible. And people are, are even when they're not lying, they, they are. I mean, they're not trying to make things up. They're trying to tell you as an accurate portrayal as possible, yeah. but it's just not good. And, and, and so th th that's how our perception works. So... Th 
what you can do is is you can build on file folders so you can sense make and problem solve faster. Time and distance is your friend. We talk about that, but how do we do it? Can can we can we process our environment faster? Can it be cognitively faster? Absolutely yes. you can. You can yes. absolutely build those file folders so you don't mistake those things. You don't become overwhelmed by events. And that's that's what the bread and butter is of, of what we do. That and Greg, you're uh I, what did you call it? A a, a, a rectal mental health exam i don't i don't know I, what that was in the last tirade i don't know it's a little late in the day uh, but listen brian uh, what you just said is accurate but i'll add one thing to that eric look at the flip side of that so uh, uh what's a copper facing well first of all if it's not on view a copper is getting the information from dispatch who's it dispatch getting it from dispatch is getting it from a witness so if you uh, think about that. Hey, listen, uh, we've got shots fired over here. And the witness is going, oh, my God, send somebody. Somebody is shooting. Okay, that copper is amped up. And what are they expecting to see when they get to the scene anyway? You know, so if you're training in a facility that's teaching you how to use the street and it's a shoot, don't shoot scenario, that's binary. Your brain don't work binary. Now what do you do? You go into a controller and you put on a headset or you stand in front of some virtual screen with a, a paintball gun or some manifestation of a gun that either recoils or doesn't recoil. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. The idea is that what's happening to that copper is the copper is learning that this is the way that reality works. And that's not how reality works. One, right. there's so many tangential uh, uh, aspects that could happen. Two, if you're already pre-programmed to see a gun, the first person out that door, whether they're the RP or they're the shooter, what are you going to see? And then people are criticizing something like Uvalde. Listen, I, 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 not enough is known. You should shut up until you know more. But I'll tell you this, okay, they're saying there was almost 400 cops. How could nobody do anything? I don't know. The Nazi party was exterminating Jews by the millions, and nobody said anything. You know what happens? There's a psychological paralysis that goes on. And all those cops showed up, and every single one, one of them wanted to do the right thing. But they were acting on a mistaken fundamental base of information and that spun out and then the more that showed up the harder it was to get anything done and to get in there you think there were cowards there was no cop on that scene that was a coward what happened is information spun out of control and the OODA loop was too short and it didn't have an, the negative feedback loop didn't have an off ramp nobody signaled hey i'm going to exit at the next turn so guess what they did they all followed like samba dancers bah, 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 bah. that's probably not the samba whatever that is and and listen <laughs> The, the problem with law enforcement today, you can't treat people like automatons. You can't yeah. build cops that are robotic. Humans have to be able to use critical thinking to address any situation that they're going into. Academies need to be longer. There needs to be more uh, mentoring and vetting and coaching, and there needs to be more FTO program. And what are we doing? How, yes. We're awash with money right now. Yeah, people are going, well, yes. we have to talk about uh, inclusivity amongst uh, tribal gangs in Uruguay. No, that and you're, you're, you're right now saying, no, that doesn't, isn't true. Look out there, the sexual orientation of monkeys in the environment. Because <laughs> there's a whole bunch of shit. The NRA is sitting on, uh, on money. The, the other organizations are sitting on money. Look, put that money together to train your cops. The cops uh, that and, you get on the street are the ones you deserve. That's, yeah, that's yeah. exactly and, it. And if you and, don't want to spend the money, then, then reap the whirlwind. And a, a lot of times, too, Eric, you, what happens, because you kind of started talking about it before, is, you know, um, as humans, especially guys, like we, we like things, right? With the G, a thing, right? We, we, we are technologically driven. We're, we're, uh, innovation is what's kept the human race alive for as long as it's been alive. That's what America especially is known for, literally just creating and innovating at such a rapid pace. So we always look for a technological solution. Okay, what tool do we, we have? We have a gun. Do we need a taser? Uh, do we need some other option? I need this. Uh, then we need a radio. And then we need to have this. And then, okay, for training, and this isn't a knock on what people are doing. It's, um, it's I, I know why they're doing it. In fact, a lot of times it comes from, well, it usually comes from a really good place and it seems logical right. at the time. But now it's like, all right, you're going to put this glove on and at some point it's going to give you a shock to your hand so you won't be able to use your firearm. Like you don't, that's the, the ass backwards way of looking at this. Like you don't, how you, train. you don't need to do that. That's unnecessary uh, because one, that doesn't help you make a better decision. What we're talking about is making a more informed decision and, and faster, right? Uh, in ambiguous and is. stressful environments. Yeah. I would agree. In absolute ambiguous and stressful environments. <laughs> and you know what, Brian, I would add again, dovetail nicely into that. Uh, Eric, you know what we're looking for? Not just a thing, not a think, but we're also looking for a scapegoat. We're scapegoating every oh, yeah. single time we go into a situation. So when Oxford shooting was going on in Michigan, scapegoat was parents. 
Now, Uvalde shooting going uh, on down there, it's Cops. the police and the leadership. Okay, listen, we're going to continue to switch because it's a fart in a blender until we get our shit together collectively and say, this is what we want to do. This is how these things work. Yeah, the the thing that I want to point out about Uvalde, and this is for, um, it's easy for us three to keep to of keep course. going down this path. I, I, I'm constantly trying to think from the perspective of untrained civilians um, that want more from their cops, want more from yep. um, their military, want more from from all of us, first responders, um, that, you know, we're out there to serve. Um, so when I think of Uvalde, and, oh, did we drop? Okay. I'm back. No, you're good. Um, when, we, when we are discussing, you talked about, you, you started to mention um, training, and, right. you know, we, we've got these weapons that, you know, pretend to shoot paintballs or, you know, they, they have the live action until you have felt the concussion. And this is for a lot of yep. people. Until you felt the concussion of just being next to a live rifle that's shooting a very large round, like a five, five, six or a seven, six two AK round. Um, your, your five, your five, five, six is basically when you think of your American soldier, um, anybody out there that that's the M four, that's your assault rifle your ar-15 that's the round that that one shoots and then your ak is you know very stereotypical russian um rifle and that's a larger round um that that does a lot of damage when you feel the concussion and when you talk to brian you mentioned you know that that our bodies are designed to survive Mm -hmm. when you feel and hear that concussion i don't care who you are and how much you've trained until you felt that felt the heat felt the sound the concussion from it, whether it touches you or not, it's very easy to say, this is what I would have done. This is how I would have went. But then you right. tr- then try a picture going through a door that you don't know if it's locked or unlocked. That's exactly. designed to keep you out. This uh, then, you know, I'm not defending or I'm just trying nope. to give f- things to consider. Yeah. Imagine trying but, but to, but let's go, Eric, listen, go further than that though. Here's the thing. We're not trying to make excuses for the cops because we weren't there. We're not trying to make excuses for the shooter because it was his fault. It's he his bought fault. the gun. He's he loaded the, one that the was gun. Responsible. He went in and killed the people, right? Yes. So, so we're ambivalent. We're, we're ambiguous. We're agnostic when it comes to that because we don't give a shit about motive. What we care about is intent. And you either demonstrated intent or you didn't. And those cops either were trained or they weren't. They either did their job or they didn't. Now you're saying, yeah, but that sounds like the binary you were talking about no what i'm saying is you have to add to what eric just told you everybody listening being shot at okay being shot at being a target and seeing the rounds rip into the wall next to you and being able to smell and hear and feel that and see that shit spinning around on the ground in front of you and feeling the heat that changes your dna forever for the rest of your life i remember being a young copper i wasn't even out of fto and a guy ran out of the house his kid shot himself with an a gun that was in the house that was ill stored, you know, it wasn't locked up or anything else. And he had the kid who was obviously dead with all his shit leaking out of his head and, and cyanotic. And he handed the kid to me and said, do something. This is my son. There you go. Yeah. It was 30 years ago and I'm, I'm, I'm choking up now. Yeah. Uh, so play with that. The idea is that folks, you can't sit there and turn back the clock and start poking holes uh, 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 and putting your finger in the dike of Uvalde or any school past or present now by saying all of these look everything that happens is a a, a, a number of puzzle pieces that bounce together like the balls in in a, a, a in mcdonald's and that thing where the kids go and play you know those balls where yeah. your kid's going to get uh uh covid monkey pox because the goddamn <laughs> things are never clean sorry mcdonald's is going to sue me but you know what i'm talking about in yeah. those environments so you're around there and you get infected and you infect others and everything happens like that well when those things are pushed together Okay, a couple of them start sticking together more often than others. That's the cue. That's where you got to start scratching and going, okay, this kid uh, 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 is called school shooter by all of his friends and his online accounts. Okay, this guy's amassing firearms and ammunition. Uh, This guy has a countdown on his social media post saying, pay attention, something really big is going to happen. And folks, if your kids are going back to school, I'll give you a little gift. The two most dangerous times for for an attack at your school are are the day that you're going back and the day that everybody's graduating. Eh, It's called the combat rule of threes. It's something I put together a long time ago, and it still works. If you're a budding student or psychologist or you're a cop around the road, start thinking about it. You've seen those cues before. So we don't work in school shootings. We work in human behavior pattern recognition 
comma, and analysis. What's the recognition? The recognition is that uh, cues will coalesce and they will tell you a story, but you got to read them. You know, just like yep. reading a fingerprint, just like reading a, a, a bullet casing in the primer strike, comma, What's analysis? Analysis is what do you do with the information? And if you're still out there writing a story on, we don't know what the shooter's motivation was. I, I don't remember the Uvalde shooter's name, but I know what his motivation was to kill a bunch of kids and kill be a bunch famous. Of people. Okay, yep. so yeah. there you go. I, I mean, well, you know, uh, 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 Putin. What's what's next? Crimea? I don't know. Let's take a look at what he's doing. Everybody telegraphs what they're about to do. You said it earlier. They telegraph by their clenched jaw or, or making a fist. But that's too late, Eric. Even though the fight hasn't started, we're here to tell you that's too late. We want to push it back to picking another bar. We want to push it back to the training that you took a week or a month or a year before that made sure that you're going to survive the situation if you get cut, stabbed, or shot. And people aren't thinking that yet, and we have to fight. Uh, yeah. My goal, and, and God, look at me. I'm not going to last much longer. You can tell that. But my goal is to leave behind a legacy of uh, safety through advancements in human behavior pattern recognition analysis. And what I mean by that, if we can predict the effing weather, we can predict and find a school shooter. So, so I want to. Are we going to be wrong? Yeah, once in a while, but not not I, a lot. I want to add some credibility to y'all um, with uh-huh. with people listening. So um, I told you this earlier before we got started that I, I pulled up. Um, I I didn't intend to get into school shootings and all that stuff in Uvalde, okay. but um, here we are. Just a natural path, just kind of went that way. Um, so I'm going to go with the organics of this, and I have actually. For those listening, this is from 2019, August of 2019. Um, I had pulled up a, a YouTube of the Left of Greg podcast. Um, it's just a clip. It's about two minutes, 20 seconds long. Um, I want you to hear what Greg and Brian talk about. And it's going to show you, like, this ain't shit they pulled from their ass. It's not shit that they're hmm. they're not used car salesmen as fast as Greg talks. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's, this is, this is, This is coming from experience, and this is what I meant when I said, I can tell he's a cop. I can tell he knows his shit because I've learned from a lot of mistakes over the years and and, and learned from other people's mistakes. And when we talked earlier about somebody coming out real quick with a cell phone that we mistake for a gun, there's a reason officers have that scenario built up in their head because suicide by cops have happened where people present their cell phone as a weapon. And guess what that training video has done? That, that video, that real life video is put into an academy, whether it's a 14 week academy, a, a four month yeah. academy, or a place like where I'm from where it's a 10 month academy. I love it. You know, I wish it was two months longer. I, you know, personally, I think a year long academy is a good one, but yeah. Um, so Amen. I want to I want to share this, and um, I want you guys to just just take a listen, and uh, Greg um, Brian will will discuss it afterwards. So let me hit the share screen here. Let me pull this up, and uh, so if you are listening, you are going to be hearing the Left to Greg podcast, and if you are watching, you will get a good visual of their handiwork. So um, let me start this, and tell me if you guys can hear it, and then we'll let it play. Listen, you can have it both. No, don't hear it. You don't hear it. No. You can have the hard target school. That's not playing against it at all? It is playing, but no, I don't hear any sound. Okay. Give me one second. I will get that fixed. Share screen. Brian, was that you? That was me. That was shorter with much shorter hair, I think. Okay, let's try this one more time. And listen. You can have it both ways. You can have the hard target school, and you can have the soft school where the the emotions uh, uh, play an important part. Is the sound coming across? The mental health. Oh, we don't we don't see no. the vid, uh, Eric. But the vid what, or the what sound. What the next phase they always do, Brian? Oh. Last time we saw just the vid. Harden, and this there we vid. go. I'm starting to hear something. Yeah. Okay, that was my fault. I forgot to activate it. I guess. Okay, here we go. Listen, guys. you can have it both ways. You can have the hard target school, and you can have the soft school where the The emotions uh, uh, play an important part in assessing the mental health of the people that are around you. But what what is the next phase they always do, Brian? We tell them this is how you got to harden, and this is where the education and training have to be. Okay? We tell them training changes behaviors, and you have to have an investment in time to get there. And then everybody ends up the thing, and it's always about money. When when the money for training a student, a staff, a teacher, a parent is less than a, a jacket, less than a pair of, of boots, less than a, a customized set of jeans that you wear uh, in, in men's small. Uh, but or, what is that? Jean large. Jean large. <laughs> but, but nobody wants to touch that, right? 
And then they come to me afterwards and, and they give the same thing that every major uh, military comes up and tells me, yeah, but just give me three. Give me, give me a yeah, bite-sized chunk. The- I only want these three things. There aren't three things. There's right. baseline plus anomaly equals decision, which happens to be three things. And those anomalies can be anywhere. So don't sit there and say when the person does this, TTP, tactic, technique, and procedure, don't say when they do this, it means this. That's why the news media is coming up and they're going all over the place and saying, well, it doesn't fit the pattern, the pattern, the pattern. The pattern is they were at school and they were killing. Stop there. That's enough. Then go in and say what was broken. So this kid every single day came in and said, I'm tired of whatever. And again, bullying. We throw bullying out there all the time. The kid was bullied. Have you ever been to high school? Everybody gets bullied. Everybody's in a clique. That's how our uh, progesterone and testosterone and all our internal uh, uh, chemicals are fighting for us to be in charge. And somebody's the shy kid and somebody's the sports nut. What you have to do is you have to level the playing field by giving everybody an advanced level of situation awareness. Once they have that increased level of situation awareness, it permeates everything in their life. They'll be a better driver. They'll be a better lover. Right. They'll be a better husband or parent or wife or kid it's, because they'll they'll be able to read the emotional capital of the people in the room with them at any time or any place. God, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> Tell you what. Oh, holy Moses, we need more of that. Yeah. That guy sounds like he knows his shit. I'm telling you that. I don't, Aaron. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm getting that echo again. Oh, is the echo coming across? How about now? It, it, no, not anymore. Okay. Yeah, went away. I think yeah, it has I something to do with sharing screen, so I'm, okay. I'll keep yeah. the screen sharing her, to a minimum. I knew her in high school. <laughs> I don't know. If she, went to, she went to East Detroit High School. I don't know if my screen is frozen, but Greg, for me, has been frozen for a while now. Um, Am I still you, moving around? Everybody's looking good and fine to me. Okay. It just yeah, must so be. I don't know what, what it Man, what it's got to be the 7-Eleven you're backed up to. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, bad Wi Fi. I love Wi Fi. I'm getting. I want to point this. Something. Let me point this out about Brian real yes, quick. Um, every military movie I've ever seen about somebody that's working secretly for the CIA has a bare bones apartment complex that they're staying in, and that's exactly, exactly. what the back of Brian. <laughs> so and every every bondage and discipline uh, uh, pur- purveyor has that same thing. It's easier to clean with a hose after he's done. <laughs> right. I, I'm he's, just saying, Brian. He's I'm ready to go. Like, you I give him that. 10 minutes, he'll be out the door with everything that he yeah, owns. He's probably got his bag with him right now. I, I, I do have two bags right here that, if necessary, we can we can go wherever <laughs> wherever we need. I do it. I, I love your show and that. We're really humbled. It's It's hard sometimes to watch because we've been doing this for so long. And like I said, I, I was talking about the dangers of school shooters uh, before Columbine happened. And uh, my thing I want to tell you is how true is the stuff we're talking about? So my wife and I, are uh, she's our CEO, uh, greatest human behavior profiler I've ever worked with. Uh, we're uh, having to drive from Your, your wife's uh, a to, human and, behavior yeah, person? Yeah. Oh, no yeah, shit. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we surround ourselves with some true Fuck. experts, and uh, she was best of me all the time. So I said, "How can I degrade her ability?" I said, "I'll marry her, and then we'll have kids." <laughs> you so, can't get away with I shit. <laughs> I to you. Our kids yeah. couldn't, and, and uh. so we're, we're uh, headed to Denver. The flight's delayed, and so Shelly and I say, "Hey, we're going to go out to dinner before we go back to the hotel." So we go outside, and we're in Denver, and there's a jewelry store robbery. Now we don't know there's a jewelry store robbery because we're not on the clock. We're we're flying, you know. We're going to Denver, and so behind me I see a guy jet across the street, and then I see a couple of people chasing him. And so we go around the next block, and she goes, "What do you got?" I go, "Somebody behind us," and man, he's running like he wants to get away, you know. And so we turn around the car and we watch a couple of times, and it's clear that two completely plain clothes coppers or security guards are chasing this guy, and the guy's doing a good job of getting away because all security guards turn into us after a while. And we get a little bit of a paunch, and we're not, you know, doing the stair stepper anymore. So I, I'm, I'm kicking it in the gym to make sure that never becomes me. So we pull up, and dog, her call sign is uh, dog, the police dog. Nobody gets away. She says, I'll take the car and call 911. She goes the one way to start giving the directions, and I go out on foot and start cutting between the buildings because what I do is human behavior pattern recognition analysis, and I know exactly who's going to come out. So he comes out, and I give him the Elkabong, and so he's reeling from the Elkabong, and I go, I have zero weapons with me. I'm dressed for the airport going through TSA. We haven't even been back to the, the hotel room. So he's clearly armed. So I took my phone. And I'm not advocating anybody does this, but I took my phone and I took the post and I said, don't move or I'll shoot. 
police stand there. Okay, other cops are coming. I can hear them, everything else. The guy did the should I stay or should I go? I said, turn around, touch the wall. He complied with absolutely everything. Why? He expected that I was a cop or I was an authority figure and I had a gun. You he what saw what he wanted to see. That, the street guy reached down and blessed me and said, please don't shoot me. And the coppers came up and they're, first of all, you know, from being a cop, they go, hey, you want to be a part of this? And I go, no. And Shelly pulls up and she goes, hey, great job. And yep. they ask her, you want to be a part of this? Nope. You know what that means. Yep. This guy, they got enough on him to go to jail. But the idea was the copper goes, hey, great move with the phone. But you know the funny part, Eric? I've always carried the pink phone. My phone case was pink, and it didn't yeah, matter. Didn't matter. In his brain, he saw the big 44 mag sticking <laughs> down in his face. And he, and what do we mean by that, folks? Am I telling you don't buy a gun, just go and buffalo your way through life? I'm saying no. There's certain circumstances where you can get in the head of the offender that's yeah. facing you, and you know everything that's going on by slowing time down and being more trained than that person is. Now, he may have wanted it more than I did, and he didn't want to go to jail, but he also didn't want to get shot in the head by the copper that came out of nowhere. So I got a question. Um I know you're going to be able to help cops. I know you're going to be able to help military. I know you're going to be able to help firefighters and stuff like that. But uh, what I'm getting from y'all that I really like is you're going to be able to help domestic violence victims. You're going to be able to help civilians. Yep. How? Explain to people okay. how. We, so I'm going to throw it to Brian, but I want to tell you that, that you caught on early to absolutely what we're laying down. So for you, it's clear. It's not clear to the average human being. Yes. They don't understand that the investment in training and this type of cognitive training is essential. I'm sorry, Brian, please. No, and that's, that's it. You're, you're bringing up it's something that actually happened one time when I was training some of the West Coast SEAL teams. We had one of their team chief was like, uh, during, during the course, was like, hey, man, like, can you, he's like, dude, look, I've been in naval special warfare for 20 years. Like, no one ever taught me this stuff. And I don't know, can you teach my kids and my wife this? I don't know how to give them my knowledge and experience right. and perspective. And that's exactly what, but, but he had it at hello. He's like, oh, this isn't just for us. This is for everyone. Like yeah. anyone can, can get, and, and so I love it when I hear, hear people say that stuff because it means uh, what our, Greg, our, our term is always, oh, he's got, he, he has it at hello. And, yep. and, and which means you get what we're going with on this. But we try to, uh, we do train, you know, we've trained community groups before, uh, school teachers, you know, all that stuff before. College because students. We, yeah, we, we keep it simple to everyday examples. Now, I use more examples from uh, uh, raising the insurgent, uh, my daughter, you know, than, than uh, with, for human behavior stuff than I do with, you know, sniper stories from the Marine Corps or when I was working with some task force doing this Precise. or that. or doing, And I do that to, to keep it at that because this is, has everything, you know, yeah, everyone wants to, do, okay, when I'm in one of these situations, I'm like, stop, stop. We're talking about flipping the switch on the next time you're going to leave your house for any reason gas stations they, I, i'm not gonna yes, get off yes. my kick about gas stations Greg, but <laughs> gas stations i always tell people the most dangerous place you'll ever go to in your life is a gas station they constantly get robbed either the people filling up with gas or the gas station itself with the convenience store there you're always seeing shootouts like this uh so there he is. Hey, were we that bad? <laughs> Holy shit. Just yeah. like Moses. Completely lost connection. The whole I, computer crash. I was we like, thought what? the FCC came on I mean, and said, nope. It, no said it, it was said it was still recording and it still does on ours. So I, we just kept going. Yep. Yeah. Um, beautiful. But, but, I but love we, it. <laughs> That's the beauty no, of having like, podcasters on your fucking show. <laughs> so well, we, we, we kept, exactly. so Eric, like I, we, I, I kept going for another minute or so. Okay. And when you weren't popping back up, I'm like, well, okay, well, He's he's off now. And Greg's like, yeah, I don't know where the hell he went. So well, we so even like, timed oh, it. It's one oh six and some change. Yeah, when yeah. you want to go back yeah. and do the edits. So. Yeah. No, it's it's funny you say that because I I've got one oh six written That's down. Hilarious. <laughs> as soon as it froze, I was like, oh shit, what the hell's going on? And then I realized it wasn't like a a Wi Fi or I'm not on Wi Fi, right. but it wasn't an internet connection. My whole computer just froze up. I was like, oh Dang. shit. So um, yeah. No, yeah, we, we saw, I literally kept going for a while. Then I'm like, I think he's gone, Greg. I don't yeah, know yeah. what happened. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. So this is one of the things that I'm really happy about because I didn't know what restream would do if I lost connection. This is the first time this has gotcha. ever happened. So the fact that it kept going for y'all is really cool. I kept my audio recording. So th that's beautiful. Um, I don't know where exactly we left off at because so I, brian brian was just talking about yeah. you said how do we take this to a civilian market brian gave you some examples i wanted to follow on to brian's yeah uh, so i say go for it back up there and yeah. then you can 
take over steering again, yes. Eric? Yeah, Would yeah, that yeah. Be okay? Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, so let's do a three. And one of the things I'd like to dovetail on that, Eric, is that when uh, Brian and I were on the West Coast on Coronado, training the people that swim around Coronado all the time, and uh, uh, then a few days later, uh, Brian was up in San Diego, and he was teaching at a school. And I remember the the person that came up to him and said, wow, it's got to be really different that, uh, you know, you did the SEALs uh, 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 all of last week, and then you did a church on Sunday, and now you're doing our school for the first couple of days of this week. And Brian's like, no, why would it be different? It's like math. Uh, you know, you don't uh, uh, have to learn the German laws of gravity. You know, you don't have to learn the Pythagorean theorem differently because you're in Japan. Science works everywhere in the world. And when we gave those people the self-same principles, they were able to use it too. So if you've got a kid, the kid needs this training. If you're a teacher or a parent, the kid and the parents need this training. People say, well, you know, it's, uh, well, you know, I don't know if we should talk about uh, sex. Look, we can't kid your kid to stop screwing. We can't get them to wear a mask for COVID. Uh, uh, maybe we can do an intervention and get them to spot these things in their environment that are going to cause them harm or danger. How, how many times do we hear this? First of all, one, people still drowned uh, uh, because they haven't learned to swim. That's ridiculous in this day and age. Uh, every time there's a graduation, some small town has six graduates in a car that are driving too fast and hit a pole, and all of them die on graduation day. If we know it, we can prevent it. We have to put leverage our intellect. We have to leverage the best of breed training programs. Not all training programs are very good. And just because they're government funded doesn't mean they've been <laughs> checked or vetted. Do you see what I'm saying? And now is the time to do it. Why? Folks, I hate to tell you this, but after a disaster, the money is everywhere. Yeah. And an agency, if they tell you we don't have training funds, they're lying to you. And, and there's always room for jello. What does that mean? You're going to train one way or the other. You're going to train before the school shooting or you're going to train after it. How do you want to come out? How do you want to look? You know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so it, where I'm looking really is, you know, this this whole the whole orientation of my podcast is is education and um, perspective, things of that nature. Right. However, you've I love when the light bulbs go off and on the podcast for me, light bulbs are going off, and what I'm seeing is you're going to help me help you. But what you're going to help me do is help prevent victims and victims mm -hmm. is who I'm concerned about, especially our domestic yep. violence victims, because that is one of the biggest things I think that your guys' training can help do. I want to help cops. One of the biggest surprises of my podcast is how many cops have reached out to me and were like, Oh my God, dude. Like I thought it was going to help civilians the most. That was really what I thought yeah. I was going to help with my podcast. And I was like, I'm going to make them understand. And they're going to see a cop's perspective and they're going to see this. No, what it really has been is me training other cops and them reaching out and be like, dude, I'm glad you had this guy on. I never thought of that. Or I'm glad you had this right. person. I never thought of that. Um, yeah. The domestic violence thing. I kind of, I didn't intentionally do it this way, but I recently had a domestic violence um, specialist. That's her whole job. She brings mm -hmm. in people from, for the victims and then helps get them uh, taken care of. And then from her that branched on, she's like, Hey, I got another guest for you that you should be interested in that. She, she, actually survived a domestic violence thing where um, the dad murdered the mother while the mother was holding her. Like she doesn't Jesus. remember that obviously, but um, it's affected her entire life. And now yeah. her whole life path has gone down that domestic violence um, rehabilitation and helping domestic violence victims. But where she specializes in is she doesn't stop with the victims. She goes and talks to the offenders. That's unheard of in law enforcement. You've been in law enforcement. How many people yep. like you, she basically shows them and goes, I'm your future. You go down this fucking path that you've already started. I'm right. your future. I'm the person that you murdered my mother while she was holding me. So I see that and I'm like, and I hear about your training and I get excited because I'm like, oh, not only can I help cops in this, not only can I help military, because I'm still in the military. I don't know if y'all know that. Um, I'm yep. still in the reserves. I'm with the 802nd okay. in Lackland. That's why you're in Texas. <laughs> That's right, baby. So I, I'm I love st it. I'm still with those boys and right. uh, and and girls. No, I'm, yeah, I just say boys in general. Um, but in general, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, 
you know, and I'm a cop down there. So this type of training, what you all are talking about, and, and what I love is the confidence behind a fucking sniper, a prior law enforcement, uh, army. I, I don't get much credit to him being an army guy, especially. Yeah, being, yeah, 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 and yeah, you should. And yeah. you've never seen real military. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I've seen real food, though. Um, <laughs> and so have I. <laughs> but um, what I, when, I, when I hear you guys talking about this, and like I said, I'm I'm just asking that the people listening to me trust my um, training and experience. When I hear them talk, I already know they're not full of shit. Like the, the full of shit meter is easy to detect. And sure. when I hear them talking, I know what they're saying to be true based on how I've done the 17 years of military and police work. So based on that, well, I get excited because I'm like, yes, I can help military. Yes, I can help police with what they're saying. But more importantly, I can help citizens survive and help themselves. And I think that's the tools that I really would like to put out there. So when we're talking about starting your training and getting into this, how does a civilian even, what do they do? How do they start out? This is simple. This is the simplest part of what we've done so far. It's always hard. Uh, We don't know you on a personal level. Now we do. We knew you at the beginning in the first five minutes, and then now our DNA is, is shared as if we are, are uh, yeah. serious in a relationship, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> which we will be, Eric, because you're a good-looking yeah. man. It burns already. So, <laughs> the idea, exactly, it's working. The idea is this, okay? We do what's called regional training. So when we go to a region, we're going to be training, for example, let, let's say in Texas, we are going to go to Houston. So Houston PD hires us to come in and put on a, a training event. So we're going to put on a, a psychological de-escalation three-day for Houston PD. While we're down there, we're also going to do what's called town halls. Every night that we're down there, we're going to have the coppers and the supervisors and the dispatchers can bring their husbands, wives, kids, significant others, and we'll go on stage and answer any other questions and all the hard topics we'll talk about. Now, you say, okay, well, I can't get together for the, the regional training. Well, it's cheaper because you can go to all the churches and synagogues in the area and you can bring representatives from them. That helps to defray the cost and their schools and administrators. Now you say, okay, listen, I get the regional training and we could have all these people, including paramedics and triage at the hospital because domestic violence can spill over into the, the hospital hospital waiting room. Do you get what I'm saying? And people are killed. And you say, wow, we could bring a whole group of these people in there. If you can't do that, we're always putting out free webinars. We got the gosh damn podcast, which doesn't cost a penny. We're always tackling those hard things. So here's the thing. I talked about classic obstructionists earlier. I'm sick and tired of hearing people give me reasons why they can't bring our training in, you know, and you're a facilitator. You're, you're a, a, an excellent example of a human being that, that is Aww. a public servant and a servant leader because you're constantly thinking about how paying it forward, paying it sideways, and paying it backwards. So I would challenge you on this before I turn it over to Brian, who's a senior VP of operations and actually knows how to get us there and knows all the phone numbers and shit. I would tell you this, Eric, uh, let's collaborate on something and let's give it a, 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 a time level. Let's say that by this time next year, we collaborate on a joint event that we put together that's going to save a lot of people. And whether you're a, a husband or a wife or a kid, whether it's domestic violence or sex trafficking, whether it's uh, uh, the schools that you're worried about or your bottom line and your business does a lot of negotiations and you don't want to leave money on the table. We're here to make you smarter and faster and harder to kill. And we do that through up armoring your brain through mm-hmm. cognition. Man, I would love. Yeah. To, uh, sorry, Brian. One, real no, quick, ahead. I would love to get you um, specifically the the lady that I was referring to earlier is one safe place. She's the one that facilitates That's like so great. Uh, all the domestic violence like survivors and, and and gets them all going and doing all that stuff. That that yes, I want. I would love to get you guys into the police training world. Which trust me, I will talk offline about that. I've got the ability to do that, but um, cops is cops are easy. That that's not that's the, that's not the selling point. The selling point for me is how can I make citizens safer? Because it's You're a, exactly right. It's a team fucking there. yeah. It's a team fucking effort. Like I, yeah. I, me as a cop, I can help keep you safe. But when seconds matter, cops are minutes away. We know that. That Brilliant. is fact, Brilliant and that's what that, that's this is a common saying. Um, if I can help give you uh, a way to prevent the seconds, 
And that's what it sounds like y'all are able to provide. It's, they don't even have to worry about the seconds because they've already avoided the situation. Yeah. And, so that, and, and you won't know the success rate because you're avoiding so many. You know what I'm saying? Yes. It's like, well, how, how, how can you prove you've done good? Well, we know we've saved tens of thousands of lives on both sides, and we can give you the examples. But what about the ones we can't prove? What about the ones where the bad guy chose a different house or the bad guy looked at you as an opponent rather than a victim and said no? That's the success stories yeah. that we can keep uh, uh, propagating and, yeah. through the training. And, and for, you know, for most people, like they don't need to be like, that's why we try to do as much for free as we can. We try to right. do the podcast and free webinars and this, because you don't, you know, most, the average person, you don't need our level of knowledge of this stuff, right? Yeah, we no. train folks like you, Eric, we train the trainers of the, of, of, of Precisely. Law but the trainers of military stuff, we do that or, or higher level, like that, that's what we do. But the idea is we, we try to do as much as we can. And, and then we also, there's, there's basic kind of general rules or guidelines when it comes to human behavior that can be applied almost anywhere. Now, it's always not 100% every single situation, but it's overwhelmingly true. And we, we try to boil those down to little things, little maxims, little uh, a saying that you can remember. And one of the sayings that I like teaching people is um, people teach you how they want to be treated which means you teach everyone you come into contact with how you want to be treated. And you don't, you, you don't have the time to say, hey, I'm Brian, like we did at the beginning, and said, hey, this is who I am, this is what I've done, this is what I do now, this is everything about me. You, you, you don't, this is what's important to me, these are my values. You, know, you don't do that. Well, how do you do it? You do it by the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress, the words you choose, uh, the words you choose not to use, how you uh, address people. You, you teach them how you want to be treated. And, and so you know, that's really powerful when you start to think about it because you have to go, well, how do I want to be treated, right? And and how is this person, you know, making me treat them? What are they doing? Because especially when you get into like the domestic violence stuff and relationship issues like that, you know, it, it's, you, people demonstrate intent, right? And especially when it comes to, to different relationship dynamics, Eric, you and I might be in a relationship and we're dating and maybe you're an abusive person, but you know what? You 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 sometimes you treat me well and you say a lot of nice things to me. Like you really do. But then like you're an abusive person. But then you know what? You say a lot of so it, it's it's you know, you, you have to go at least what is someone demonstrating? What are they showing you? What are they teaching you? Words spoken language as we know it today has like only been around what 12, 15,000 years, something like that, maybe even less. Um, um, so, so much more, it's so much more important of what we do versus what we actually say. What am I showing you? And if I can sit down, we literally, like I'm sitting here right now, Eric, with, with a yellow pad and my, my black pen, there you go, to make notes, I can write these things down. And then it's clear in the light of day. Uh, a situation that made me feel a certain way. What was it about that? What was the behavior? What was it they said? What was it that they did? And if I write that out and look at it, well, now I have something I can articulate. And now I know what and how to look for those things, right? And so, so that's the, the, especially when it comes to victims of that type of stuff, they're very tough dynamics. And you know this, the general public doesn't realize that, you know, especially when you get the, well, why wouldn't you just leave? It's like, oh, okay, like, yeah. <laughs> Greg, Greg, Greg brought it up at the beginning. Like, How did the Nazis kill millions, millions of let's people? Let's fix our well, brain. You know what yeah. I mean? Like th yeah. this it should is, take a million years. You're, you're, yeah, you're you're wired to to <laughs> kind of believe stuff, and and you have well, things like, you know, basic fundamental attribution errors. Eric, if you're nice to me, I assume you're a nice person. Okay. Well, Ted Bundy was really nice to a lot of people, not so much to others, right? So, so we, <laughs> he we, was we nice to them at first too. Yeah, yeah we, he was. We, we fall into yeah. this trap and we don't ever look at. Well, I know you're telling me this, but what else could you mean by that? And okay. and I know everyone goes, well, you 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 do that with everyone you meet. I go, well, yeah, technically, but but Absolutely. here's the thing. 99% of people are who they say they are. Maybe it's not that high. Maybe it's 95% right, of people. Are yeah. who they say they are. What you majority see is what it is. Yes, it's it's huge. Yeah. There's only a small amount of people that really intend to do you harm, mm -hmm. and you have a say in that. Now, sometimes you just walk out of somewhere, and like Greg said, that that asteroid falls down and hits you. Yeah, you didn't see it coming, but hey, you know what? Someone in the Air Force sitting in a bunker complex somewhere knew it was coming. Like they meaning, you, it, 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 they were tracking it. Now yeah. you didn't get that information, right. but the idea is, most there is no bolt out of the blue. There is no uh, lightning strike. It's it's all preventable. So, so if Brian gave you that simple piece of advice, and I know we're probably going long, and we'd love to do a future show with you if you that's not in at the all. Card. 
Typically, uh, I go it, two and a half, three hours. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, you're good. I, I didn't know if we were doing that. My, my, my thing to you is I'll give you another simple piece of advice. So add to what Brian just told you. Uh, people want their say, uh, uh, not their way. Almost every single human being that you encounter is going to want to say their piece. They're going to say it to the uh, 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 flight steward when your flight's yeah. delayed. They're going to say the it manager, to their waiter or waitress when your food yeah. comes. You get what I'm saying? Now, the Karen complex. Why? Because people, yeah, yeah and, and, and you know that it goes before Karen. It was back with Oogluck and Mukhtar, right? So it, it's been around <laughs> since there's been humans around. Yeah. But the idea of it is that you have to be careful as a fellow human when a person wants their say and their way. So if that person starts demonstrating intent, which means that you're getting cues from the environment that I'll give you a very simple thing that happens to people all the time. Uh, you pull up to a gas station and a person is panhandling and they come over to you with a, a gas can and they're like, hey, brother, uh, can I ask you a question? If you establish a very clear boundary, hey, not today, fella, and that person keeps coming, that's a demonstration of intent. So now you tell the person, hey, listen, please just leave me alone. And then they keep coming. But what happens is every situation that we have to investigate is a homicide with the, the white chalk lines around the body always started where the person didn't get those initial cues, and now the person's right up on it. And are you saying, well, so every person that's coming up with the gas No, every person that's coming up with the gas tank is testing you. Your environment is constantly testing you. The, the people that are going around looking in your car for your computer, which is out of the bag, left on your front seat, not in this seat because you have just a little lump of clay. But the idea is when they look, they're sizing you up. And, and when you walk into the Walmart or when you go to park or when you're getting your family and you're going out to eat, they do a cost-benefit analysis on you. So why wouldn't you do the smart thing and take a look at the environment and go, almost everybody wants their say, almost nobody wants their way, and it's the most dangerous when it's a combination of both of those. If you add that to what Brian just told you, and then you go one step further, baseline plus anomaly equals decision. What does that mean? If you wanted to figure out if your old lady or your husband or your significant other, whatever relationship you're in, if that person's treating, uh, cheating on you, the signals for danger and opportunity are very close. I want to get in better shape. I want to, you know, drop off a card and, and, bring by a hamburger and give you the flowers. And uh, uh, when I'm with you, I'm going to spend a lot more time on giving you that attention. But guess what, uh, man, work is calling. And that's why I got to step out on the balcony because, you know, it's a private work call. Hey, if you don't work for the NSA or the Pentagon, you don't have private work calls. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the idea is that, that people that are trying to screw around with you are constantly doing this behavior and that behavior that don't fit what? Their baseline, baseline. every day. You know, we would come home and we would watch uh, You Bet Your Life. Uh, uh, every Saturday, we get up and we go uh, uh, yard sailing. Uh, uh, every Wednesday night, is spaghetti night. Well, listen, if there's a change in that, small, subtle changes over time disappear because you're a human. You don't pay attention to them. They don't fit the danger metric that Brian was talking about with survival early on. So guess what? You overlook them. If we would take that yellow pad and put a timeline of our son or our daughter or our school or a kid in school or our friends or the 7-Eleven, and we would start looking at that situation and go, wow, everything's been kind of normal. They've had jobs. They're getting a better job. Now they're buying a car. Every time that you get the deep, do bot, deep, oh, uh, that's a danger signal, okay? And every time that you get something where you expected one signal and it's not there, Baseline plus an anomaly, that becomes an anomaly. Every single anomaly in your life has to be investigated. Would you drive your car if the red light on the dash came up? You do like Penny in, in uh, uh, the Big Bang Theory. You put a Band-Aid over it. No, if you put a Band-Aid over it, sooner or later, you're going to be hitchhiking, right? The idea is your life is exactly like that. Look behind the perndle for that little red warning light. And when God and Vishnu and Buddha give you that warning light, you have to act and you have to act fast because life goes really quick in an emergency situation. And you said it perfectly about the minutes and seconds analogy. I, I love that. I'm going to steal it and act like it's mine. Take but, it. but the idea is if you're, uh, uh, look, you call the cops and you expect the cops got everything. We're seeing cops are getting killed too. So cops don't have all the answers. Cops aren't some uh, uh, Superman. They got a really, really hard job and, and different than most jobs. Most lawyers don't get shot in a courtroom. Do you hear what I'm saying? Most GM employees don't get shot on a line. Has a person walked in and smoke checked one on a GM line? Yep. Has it happened in a court? Yep. So the idea is it's less popular, like a school shooting. It's a statistical anomaly that doesn't happen very often. But it's so big that it changes everything in that world. 
So don't wait for your life to turn into that. Don't wait for your car to break down on the side of the road. Don't wait for your heart uh, uh, to pound out of your chest because you're drinking rippets all the time and, and chain smoking and you're not, you know, eating anything but fatty food. Look, I, I didn't get fat overnight. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm trying to say? That shit didn't sneak up on me. Yeah. I knew what I was doing. Yeah. So, so the idea is most of your safety, most of your survival is your responsibility. And now, like you, we're facilitators of that. We're going to help. And this isn't a sales pitch. It's common sense. Almost everything we talk about, Thomas yeah. Paine would be nodding. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Almost absolutely everything that we're bringing up is simple common sense that any one of your viewers or listeners could tune into. Yeah, and I, I hope my viewers um, understand and, and have picked up for me that I, I'm not, one, I'm not on here to pitch shit. Right. Um, that's right. never been a goal. Um but I will back and, and at least voice my opinion when I hear legit shit. And I will call bullshit when I hear bullshit. Um, That's perfect. And I haven't heard bullshit yet. I do have a oh, counter, you will. I do have a counter <laughs> question um, yeah. to try to find out, not necessarily bullshit, but um, uh, the flip side of everything. We're talking about predictors, and, and, and that's yep. been the kind of the focus, like we're trying to prevent stuff. My question is, how does your training address the officer or the military member or the ambulance worker who whose words instigate. Yeah. So yeah. The, the funny thing is that, that we work with, uh, we work, we have a bunch of strategic partners, some of which we can't discuss on, on your show. But let, let us tell you that those are the hard problems that we address with those leaders because – those people have to be culled from the herd. You have to cut them. You have to, to get rid of them soon because that's where all your litigation money is going to go to. That's where all your insurance money is going to go to. Listen, those people are, are, are like the old Corvair, unsafe at any speed. Ralph Nader had it right. Too bad he's dead, right? The idea is that you have to do the same thing there as you would for an insider threat at your school. Every kid knows that's the one that's most likely to come back and shoot up the school. Every copper knows by name the person on that shift is the most likely to walk in and start fist flying or, or you know, be badge heavy or do one of those things. There's no room in police work for that. Uh, uh, the reason that we have appellate courts is that sometimes judges make mistakes. Sometimes juries overlook things. Sometimes the evidence taints the process. So the great thing about it is we have a series of checks and balances that somebody's always, you know, counting our math, taking a look at it and going, no, look what you did here. OK, we need to get back to that uh, uh, ethical standard uh, uh, in police work. And I'm not saying that the majority of coppers are smart and trained and ethical, but you've got 18,000 police agencies. So do some slip through the cracks? Yep. And you know what normally happens? Greater levels of violence occur in the agencies that have less education and training. Why? Because when my Rolodex, if you know what a Rolodex is, comes up on a blank card, then guess what? It's back to Vegas, and I'm, I'm now betting all in all the time and throwing the dice and seeing where they're going to fall. That's not predictive analysis. Predictive analysis you can do in a stock market. It's good over time. Predictive analysis you can do with the weather. You can do it with workout. You can change your diet. Look, you don't need to spend money on a gosh damn app. Change your diet and exercise, you know what I'm saying? And you're going to lose weight or you're going to get in shape. So why not stick with those simple things that you can handle today? Uh, number one. Uh, uh, situation awareness is not the end all be all. It's critical thinking. But how do I just improve my situation awareness? Uh, number 1A, turn off your phone and put it in a box. And you're going, yeah, but I won't have it to call emergency. What did you do before the phone? You get what I'm trying to say? Shut up for a minute. There's all kind of ways of doing that stuff that you don't have to. What I'm telling you is when you're in your car and you're texting, you're not looking at the people in the cars around you and you're going to get carjacked. When you're in the mall and you're texting, OMG, isn't he cute? You're not paying attention to the shooter dragging a bag of ammo in from the parking lot. The idea is that your safety and security are in your hands. What are you going to do about it? If you didn't go to the dentist and all your snags fall out and you got to gum your yogurt, then don't come to me and say that I didn't take those cues, I didn't brush, and I didn't floss. The writing is on the wall, and all you have to do is look at these small indicators from historical precedent and say, this will make me safer. If cops did that, if, look, paramedics are getting smoke checked, firemen are getting killed, it doesn't matter what your line of work. Uh, uh, last night, a, a horrific situation, don't know when this will air, but a, a, a guy tried to be a family annihilator. A cop had too much. Uh, shot all his family. Uh, uh, only two died, you know, after he drove through the crowd of the people and did it. Those things don't just happen. 
there was all kind of stress fractures visible for minutes, hours, weeks, and, and months before that incident. We just got to start talking about it. We got to stop the stigma about talking about it. We got to encourage parents to talk about their kids more uh, because their kids are talking online about shit they would never believe. And if they're not involved in that, that social leakage is going to slip by. We have the controls in our hand. And if we don't pay attention to that red uh, 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 signal on the dash, we're going to be pulling over. And, and and right now at 120 degrees, who's going to stop and pick you up? I ain't. Yeah. Brian, you got anything to add on that? So a lot of our, our solutions and the way we look at things now kind of haven't sort of caught up to the technological advantages we have. And, and right. so so how we look at it sometimes is still based on on things that are outdated or, or nonsensical, even though someone's taught you how to do it. And so I'll give you an example from my experience that, um, like I said, I, I spent a lot of time in the city of Ramadi in the El Ambar province of Iraq. And it was very different in 2007 than it was in 2004. Okay, 2004, it was literally the Wild West. I mean, it was absolutely insane. Fast forward, I go back 2007, uh, um, and it, it's a different fight. It's a different time. It's changed. Well, some of the people I was there with were still acting like it was 2004. Yep. And I had to say, like, what are you doing? Well, we know these guys. I go, this is not, we don't, we don't just boot in doors now. Like, you, you knock and you say, hey, can we talk to you? Like, it's a different fight now. Like, because right. all you're doing is if I, you know, I mean, you know how it is, especially in law enforcement. If, 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 a, if a cop is a dick to me, guess what? You're all assholes, right? And it, it never comes down on you. So, Eric, if you pull me over and you're a complete asshole to me, we, set, we never see each other again. But guess what? Who, who am I, who am I going to take that out on? The next cop. The next, so you cop. Got the next guy who's yeah. the greatest guy ever, who's like, the you know what I mean, is going, hey, how you doing? And right. they're like, F you, and the situation's going great. That, that's, how, that's how it works. That's how humans humans are. And if I see one bad thing, you're all bad. Or if I see one good thing, you're all good. That's, that's what we do. We don't like complexity. We don't look like, like the, the, the nuance of it all. But what I mean is, like, we don't always uh, make the best decisions because we think, all right, especially – Man, I love law enforcement guys, military guys, and girls. Doesn't matter. Um, you know, you're 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 that type A. We want to get stuff done. We we need to uh, uh, we need to make an arrest. We got to go get them now. And it's like, hey, you know how much technology has changed? Is that like we can find that person now? Like we don't have to literally continue this chase. Like we know who that is. We or can foot get pursuit. them. Or because exactly. the idea is is it, it's so much worse. Meaning. Look at all of the the potential outcomes of. I mean, there was one in Chicago recently where I spur my memory of it, where it was they got called off a pursuit chasing the guys who just committed a homicide. They jump in a car, they get the vehicle description, they're chasing it, and you're like, what? Okay, so there's one chance that you know it ends. They pull over, they give up, and you arrest them with nothing happening. What are the chances of that happening compared to all of the other things? And it's just like back to the school shooting thing. School shooting is, if you were a statistician, if you're a mathematician, you're looking at it. If you were an insurance company, you would insure every school in the nation against it. You would have no problem underwriting it. Why? Because you would almost never have to pay out because it almost never happens. But when it does happen, it changes the entire DNA of the country. It's so significant, the impact. Well, you have to look at that at a micro level now in your city, that, that per, per, go back to that pursuit. What, what are all the potential negative outcomes of this? So is the juice really worth the squeeze? Well, you were just going to let them get away. No, we're not going to let them get away. We're just going to choose a different time and place, right, to, to, to have this situation occur versus right now. And it's when you're in the moment, man, <laughs> it's, that's almost impossible to do. It's literally almost physically impossible to once you get to a point where this is my target, this is where I'm going in on, this is what we're doing, to walk that back in the moment is so incredibly difficult. That's why you have an overall supervisor who's in that that air conditioned room going, "Hey, you know what? I'm calling it." And people are like, "F you, you don't know what it's like." Even though that guy just did like 20 years, you right. know what I'm saying? Like, it's like it's yeah. like you don't know what's going on. It's yeah. like, yeah, no, I do actually. Yeah. That's why I'm calling it off because yeah. I don't want this to turn into a shootout. Then a kid gets shot. Then there's damage to the city, and 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 the and it's summer. So guess what? Everyone's doing now. They're out and they're protesting and they're burning the streets down. It's like. 
the juice isn't worth the squeeze. We can still apprehend those people and go after them. We have to utilize the technology we have better for that, not just all at bang in that immediate situation. Right. And, and we have to take a full 360 look at everything, and everybody's doing 360. Stop for a minute. That's not what I'm t telling you. What I'm telling you is that let's talk about that potential police pursuit now in the clear light of day when we're all sitting around having a bourbon, not when it's in progress and somebody calls it in. <laughs> and now let's add a level of complexity. Uh, one, it's hours of darkness. Two, it just started to rain. Uh, three, the cops got a fleet vehicle and they didn't check the oil and check the fuel and check the tires <laughs> and all the stuff. Every cop out there is going, I do that every night. Again, it's Not all of you fuckers do. You know ass. it, yeah. <laughs> right. Kiss my yeah, ass. Yeah. Because you know those oxygen thieves never do that shit. <laughs> you know, just like using the, the uh, uh, barrel of the shotgun for their cigarette butts and stuff. And there's coppers <laughs> that know exactly what I'm talking about. But the idea is that I just gave you five level of complexity. Now, let's add physiological. Uh, you didn't get much sleep last night because you went to your uh, co you know, uh, sponsors. Wedding. Poor diet. Uh, uh, you, you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You got a poor yeah. diet, poor sleep, this, that, and the other. You're, now, you've now been working 12-hour shifts for three straight weeks. Yeah. yeah. And now somebody uh, from a TV show is next to you in a jump seat with a camera on. And you know what? This might be my only chance at stardom. So I don't want to miss out on that. Whatever is going on. And now let's add it's Sunday. And guess what? It's Sunday afternoon. And there's a barbecue that's going down on 4th Street. And we know that barbecue is going. But that pursuit might start up. And then, hey, let's put a cop in front of that pursuit with a guy that's not listening to a light and siren and a copper anyway. And let's put him out there with a stop stick. You now have 10 that we just threw out on. Uh, these are the tabletops that agencies need to be talking about. This is your on-duty roll call. For five minutes in the morning. You need to take a knee yeah. and say, hey, Minimal. listen, we need a little bit of, yes, we need a little bit of critical thinking out there tonight. Uh, be your own boss when it comes to these. Uh, uh, and, well, listen, uh, go back to our military and police training. Who can call uh, a ceasefire? Anybody. So if anybody can call a ceasefire, then we have to police our own ranks because the, the low standard that you walk by is the low standard that you accept. Uh, and that's not mine. That's yeah. a... a it's a great uh, uh, foreign general that came up with that and the, the height of bad stuff that was going uh, overseas. But I'll tell you right now, man, I'm not a platitude person. You're in charge of your destiny. You want to fix it, then you got to start with training. And and everybody out there that's a training officer that's on Greg's bad side, okay, uh, uh, this side over here, is going to go, hey, we need more shooting and we need more semi-automatic weapons and we need a 40 millimeter, uh, you know, uh, de-escalation oh. cannon that also has a T-shirt that says I got fragged by so-and-so. Those cops are out there because they can't see the forest for the trees and they don't understand that there's a sociological, a psychological, and a physiological component to every decision they make and, more importantly, to those decisions they're not making. Yeah, you'd be surprised at what you see in a roll call today. Uh -huh. and, and in the civilian world, what I want you to understand is, like, back in the day when roll call used to go down, um, the Sarge walked in the room. You know, you're talking officers, then sergeant. So that's, 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 yep. that's, this is a generalization. Some ranks may vary depending on the department, but um, overall, and we're talking military too. Um, you've got your, your, your lower ranks and then the, the, the flight sergeant, uh, army and platoons or whatever it's sure. called. I don't, I don't know your guys' <laughs> ranks necessarily. What's a flight sergeant? <laughs> yeah, it's Air Force, <laughs> you know, it's like. Everybody <laughs> starts in the Air Force with three stripes. Yeah, yeah. That's your, that's going in. Do you feel what I'm saying? And then for like every week or month, yeah. I think you guys give what, two? Yeah, you know, you know, that's it's hilarious. good behavior. But um, the, <laughs> the, the point that I'm getting to is when they walked in the room, you shut the fuck up. And that yeah. was how it was. And it's not that it's a wrong thing, but culture has changed. And now yes. everything is, I need to explain the why. And, or, you know, that, that strict discipline isn't there anymore. When the sergeant walks in the room, now he's got to kind of stand there and be like, when y'all shut the fuck up, I'm going to start talking. Like, you know, it just depends on the, wow. the sergeant. So that that's that's the culture we've gotten into. And it's not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's good. But that's where we're at now. So when the sarge walks in the room, um, these are the things that we need to start utilizing during our roll calls. And You're exactly right. One of the things yeah. that I'm, I'm curious about for y'all, and, and we this was part of the question that I had earlier, um, you started – you guys answered it brilliantly, but um, 
when we start to get those guys that we know are instigators, not intentionally, they don't, I don't even think they know. They don't know that about themselves. They don't have that self-awareness yet. Um, or they don't have that life experience because they were kind of socially isolated. That's going to be more and more common where we yes. buried ourselves in these things. Yep. I'm one of yes. them. You know, I'm not going to yeah. lie. I, I love having a cell phone. It's such a great tool for me. Um, but I come from the experience of, I didn't have to survive with this. I didn't, I didn't start with this. So right. I understand you knew life before it. Yes. And, and I can appreciate the calmness and the, the simplicity of before having it. So um, <laughs> the officers we have coming through now, yeah, they don't have that experience. So what I'm asking y'all is, let's say I identify that person, which is let's be fair. Let's 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 act. Let's let's side on the air of caution here that the majority that are going to start coming through don't have these skills. I can't fire them all. I can't get so, rid of them. Yeah, yeah that's, but that's a here, great point. Thing. How do and, I fix it? I would, I, Let me I would give you a say, quick analogy, uh, Brian. Before I hand it off to you from a 30 year cop, okay. They're going to come through the academy, and it, when they come through the academy, that's where they got to be weeded out. They've got to be weeded out first in the interview process and then in the academy because almost everybody that shows up has grand intentions. They're in good physical shape. They've got great uh, uh, mental acumen. They want to do a good job for their community. There's only a very, very, very small margin of those folks that want to do bad. And the way that you uncover them is you understand that they're born fully grown. I give you a quick analogy. So I go to Afghanistan the first time, and I'm walking around with our Afghan counterparts back then called uh, Mujahideen, which that later on turned into a bad name for an Afghan soldier, you know, the Muj, right? But back then at the Mujahideen, uh, 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 I would say stuff like, well, I'm at Karzai. And they'd go, who's Karzai? And I'd say, well, you know, Kabul. And they go, where's Kabul? And I go, like, you guys over that hill? And they had no phones. Uh, they were sheep herders. They were working in their neighborhood, and they thought that I was a Soviet soldier. And so after a while of educating them on all those things, right, I went back. I come back for another tour. It wasn't like, like Brian was saying. It wasn't six, eight months later, and all of a sudden everybody's talking on a Roshan, and they're calling for fire as if they've been using that technology <laughs> their entire lives. Right. The problem is you didn't earn it. And because you didn't earn it, you don't understand the, the, the life and death decisions. You don't understand uh, uh, how you're complicit in the lack of those decisions. And you don't understand that you're responsible. You're, 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 uh, there's a, uh, uh, Brian, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a, a real tangible outcome to the, like a criminal. A criminal doesn't think about their actions because they want to get the pleasure in the moment. Those coppers are not understanding that they're going to be responsible. Consequences. They're going to be responsible for shitty case law. They're going to be responsible for social upheaval in the street. They're going to be burning down neighborhoods because of their inaction or because of their action or because of their statements, because of their affiliations. We hear about the racism in the military, and somebody out there is going, yeah, brother, I've seen it. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, I was in the military for a good long time, and I didn't see it. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and it needs to be addressed. But what we do is it's a panacea. Brian said it earlier. What we do is we perceive this problem through our lenses, so therefore we think it's the worst thing that's going on in the world. If we change the training cycle, if we make it hard but solvable, and if we teach cognition, critical thinking, rather than all the, you know, you need the shooting and the jumping, and we're not talking about that. We're not talking about changing that. We're talking about understanding intent and consequences and decision-making. Decision-making where? In, in extremis, in hard situations. Because the cop is generally going to do the right thing when he comes up and somebody says, hey, you blew your uh, uh, trimmed grass onto my lawn. You know, uh, officer, his bird is singing at night and I can't sleep. That's the mundane shit that happens 23 out of 24 hours. But it's one call, man with a gun, that's going to change the rest of your life. So, so let's not focus just on shooting our way out or arresting our way out. Let's invest in thinking our way out of these hard but solvable situations. Brian, what yeah, do you got to no, add? And I, I always say, you know, uh, look, it's not someone's fault that they were raised with a screen in front of their face their whole life. Right. It's just not. It's really not. So it's up, uh, up to you or someone to go, hey, look, this is how things are. So here's how we're going to use that. And, and this is where I'm a big fan of, okay, hey, role playing is uh, great for outside the bedroom too, right? You can uh, uh, come up with a scenario or thing that you want them to do and go, give me your phone. I'm going to record you. All right. Now act that Says out. Says Brian from you, a Motel tell, Six. Clearly, <laughs> tell me from behind you. Tell me how you do that, or say that, or this is what it looks right. like, and then show it to them. And they go, yep. "Well, you know what most people do? They're like, 
Wow, I look like a bumbling moron. It's like, I don't know if you had this when you were first started with your podcast, but I did. I hated hearing my own voice. It's uh, awful. Like, it's like the worst thing. What do, you, what do you have to do? You have to literally, after a while, you just do it so much, you keep listening to where, okay, you no longer care about that, yeah, right? right? But when you first hear it, you're, it's very self-reflective. You're like, holy yeah. crap, I didn't know I sucked so much. Now you I know? depend I didn't on know it. I said, now I, yeah, now, now <laughs> I didn't know I said, um, so many times, right? So those are the things that people don't right. see it. Well, then use the technology. Everyone's got a camera on their phone. Just record them doing it, and they're going to go, holy crap, like, yeah, I look like a robot. Or, yeah, I didn't, I didn't express that well. Because yeah. they have to learn how to do that. And you can be demonstrative when you do that stuff. Show people how congruence works in your body language, right? The words coming out of my mouth have to manifest what my body is saying so that the person receives and understands the message. And they might not like it, but I have to, I have to give it in a manner that makes sense. And those things, they, they, they seep into everything that you do. It's, uh, you know, you can get better. You get better at, at talking to your wife and to your kid or your husband and Amen. someone else's kid whatever it is so I, I mean the the idea is it's not just in these okay we have a dangerous situation that might escalate no man like i look at every situation that might escalate like when greg and i are driving in a car together we could be it, we're, we're one you know wrong step away from you know smoking crack and robbing a bank and going on a three-state shooting spree you know i mean like every things day. can escalate things can escalate very yeah. very quickly. that's our business plan as a matter of fact <laughs> that's our backup you know i think it's on our business cards too right? that's why that's why we're in trouble no, but oh you're my exactly God. right, Brian. And the idea, the idea, Eric, if you're going to try to make a huge change, uh, I smoke, I don't, but I smoke, uh, uh, chain smoke, a pack and a half of cigarettes every hour for the 10 or 12 hours I'm up every day. So, oh my God, this is killing me. Tomorrow I'm going to stop smoking. How many people follow their New Year's resolutions? So if you're a town administrator, if you're a district attorney, if you live in a city and you give a shit about the city that you live in, Go do a ride along, get involved in the local politics, find out yeah. what's going on in your neighborhood and instrument positive change. Uh, uh, do cops need to be changed? Yes. And they have since there were cops since, since they took the club and they said, I'll guard the cave. Mm -hmm. We've had an instrument change. Why? Because it's not the same. Some things are the same. You know, we used to use the term 172 years ago that uh, uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay, that came from, you know, almost 600 years ago, uh, Funakoshi Gichin that said if a nail sticks out, pound it down. That came from some Greek guy that was going, hey, pound that nail down before you trip. The idea is that good ideas stick around. We have to go back to those good scientific-based ideas about how to run things, and, and we're not doing that. We're so stressed out that we're going to make a wrong choice that all of our stuff is about ban binary choice making in a machine. We got to teach people how to talk to people. Have you have you had a waiter or waitress lately that couldn't look you in the eye and kind of just wandered around the table till you started <laughs> yeah. talking to them? Would you like to take our order? Yes. Okay. I mean, that type of customer service and satisfaction is going to be rampant in everything that we do in a couple of years if we follow down this path without education our, ourselves about tactical decision making under stress and, and certainly about cognitive cognition uh, 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 to the point of. Uh, uh, advanced critical thinking. If we can do that, if we can do just that, look at the big change we could make in a generation here. Yeah, Brian, I like what you said um, when it comes to trying to start uh, not necessarily singling out, but this is going to be a this is going to be a huge. I don't want to say issue, but this is just the the cultural change. You know, mm -hmm. everybody. You know, right. like I don't understand it's, how my kids could listen to this music. Da da da. You know, stuff like yeah. that. So yeah. filming them. We yeah. all, we all, I don't care. I was an instructor. Yeah. I had this on me at all times. I've always yeah, had right. it. It's instantaneous feedback. Yes. And so the, I told you, I like to, I, my whole point of this podcast was more to educate civilians, but it tend to mm -hmm. tend to um, uh, educate police more than, than anybody that I intended to um, educate. So police that are listening, trainers, um, future trainers, right. anybody looking to adjust their programs, um, this is this is huge. This is something that is not coming from me directly, but something that I have utilized in the past, but it had already become a problem. Yeah. Us as officers, and Greg, I know you're going to be able to test this as a cop. You, day one of the academy, you can be like, that dude's not going to make it, or that dude's going to be a problem, or even in the military. Brian, I'm sure you, yep. sniper training, you immediately, yep. without 
even being able to articulate why you yep. already knew that dude ain't going to make it. He's not going, he's not going to make it through this training. So it's the same for us instructors when it comes to policing. When you are an academy instructor for our officers out there, if you get the hint, the notion that this person isn't going to make it and you go based on those spidey senses, cause you don't have a way to articulate it, get your fucking cell phone out, start recording yeah. them. And one, maybe flip the script. Show that guy exactly what you see, and he fixes it. That's great. Or there you girl. go. That would be great. That That's optimal because we don't want to waste any money that the city used to go through a background check, get this dude in there. You know, background checks are typically, what, 60 grand-ish, uh, depending on where you're at. Brian's um, is. Oh, shit, Brian. I know Brian's background. <laughs> I got, I got, I got a secret right. clearance. He's probably got top secret at <laughs> minimum, and uh, I know his has cost a lot more than mine. Um, so... Uh, you get that going and that like, I want like Brian, that's a really good, that's a really good tip. And that's something I want people to pick up from what you said on that. If we get the socially awkward, we get the person that we believe to be an issue right from the get go, because we need to start trusting our instincts, get your phone out, film it and show them. And, and here's the other thing. and, And this is a difficult thing to do in the moment, right? I'm, I'm always, I'll, I'll be the tell, you know, I understand sociologically how groups form, uh, how they do well, how they do poorly. You know, if you see a high level of organization and a low level of sophistication, they're going to do really well. Um, and, and groups that do really well um, are ones that police their own. And, you know, it's part of like, you could apply that to like, look at the political parties in the U.S. They're all at each other's throats internally. You're not going to do well if that's the case. The ones that go far are the ones that police their own. And it's really hard to do, but I'll give you an example outside of this, but you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. So we did a little bit of work, um, especially during when COVID first hit and the pandemic happened in actually in healthcare, developing training programs on how you could do this and apply it. And, and it was a really cool concept, right? So we get to hang around with a lot of healthcare professionals, doctors, people, and like, they'll tell you like horror stories of other doctors or like, you know, they're complaining about how high their medical malpractice insurance is. And oh man, we saw this doctor and they'll laugh and tell all these stories. And I'm sitting there listening and I'm laughing along and go, Hey, so uh, what did you do to get rid of that guy? And they're like, what? I'm like, what did you do? to get rid of that doctor. Right, and yeah. they were like, well, there's not much and you got to understand and people are short staffed. I go, that's why your fucking insurance rates are so high because what you walk past is what you're willing to accept. Now you can't get rid of all bad behavior. You can't get rid of all bad people. But what you can do is set the standard, right? So that you're, you're hey, you know what? You're not getting away with shit on my watch. They'll go somewhere else or they'll find a different job. Or, you know what I'm saying? So the idea is those little things you see of someone stepping out of line, that's where it needs to happen so you don't wait. But we have a hard time doing that internally in a group, especially when, especially when we're under attack. So if there's a lot of people who are saying our whole profession is fucked up and needs to change, what do we start doing? We start banding together. Naturally, that's going to happen. And it's us versus them. And you know what? Now I'm willing to look past some something that's going on because you know what? Hey, that's my brother. That's my sister. That's someone I depend on. Okay. And short term, I understand that. And that may make sense. But in the long run, what does that do? And and this is that's a whole separate conversation that is very difficult. I am. We'll not do that saying, for a second episode. Yeah. yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah saying and, that's and we easy, do but but, I, but I, you get I, what I'm saying. So let me give you a common sense analogy, okay? Because the the people that are listening to your podcast or broadcast might feel that they don't have the 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 power to fix or to change something. And the answer is yes, you do. Think of a high-functioning team. Think of a major league baseball team, major league hockey team, or a major league uh, uh, football team, whichever those that you're closest to. Is there a chance that tonight when you're watching, they're going to grab somebody that's not been playing very well and that didn't do very well in the academy and, and you know, is at everybody's throat and go, fuck, put John in. Nobody does that. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Why? Because high-functioning teams have uh, the minors. Uh, high-functioning teams have scouts. High-functioning teams have gating mechanisms. And guess what? If you're not hitting, if you're not up to your baseline behavior, you're not going into the game tonight because statisticians and everybody's working on it. If we're investing that kind of money in our sports, why aren't we investing that kind of money in our police? That's And, and there's another brilliant. kiss my ass moment. I'm just saying. Holy so shit. if Eric, if we get that, if we get that after a couple of bourbons and a couple of uh, hot hours in front of the, the podcast <laughs> screen, 
and, and you know what? Who, what contractor out there is going to go? Well, it's not that easy. Again, kiss my ass. Yeah. The idea is yeah. it's as easy as you want to make it, and money solves all problems. And we're awash with money because neither the Republicans nor the Democrats know how to fix it. So what do we do? Whenever we have that, we look for precedent because historical examples are the best examples. We got to slow down. We got to band together rather than be at each other's throats. We got to open our ears and shut up a little and listen to what the experts have to say, right? And then guess what? We'll get somewhere. Declaring a climate emergency is going to fix nothing tomorrow. Yeah. But it may save <laughs> Ryan's daughter's future. Do you see what I'm trying to say? That's the weight. So stop throwing words at it. Stop throwing platitudes. Take that gosh damn thing from behind your desk that says hang in there and throw it out the <laughs> fucking window yeah. because it's not making you a better human. Go across the street and talk to the person that lives there and go, I'm Greg. What's your name again? Because most people never do that. Find out who belongs on your street. Find out who goes to the place that you go shopping. Shop at a different time. Don't shop uh, uh, at a time when, uh, you know, uh, think about it. Shooters are up in the bed all day. When, what are they doing then? Well, then they're playing video games. What are they doing? Then they're getting high. What are they doing? Then they're talking to their shitty loser friends about, you know, we should kill somebody because we got nothing else going on. Don't get into that loop. Yeah. The Mobius loop of choices is so simple. Today, I'm going to be a uh, 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 crack hooker. No, I don't want to be a crack hooker. I want to go get a job. And, and people are going, you just don't understand. I do understand. I'm the guy that does understand. And physiologically and psychologically, you need to understand you're broken, not me. But guess what? We're all little broken human beings. So we all have to step up and we have to say the emperor has no clothes and we have to start over. It's not that hard because we're not that far gone. For everybody that will tell you this is unprecedented and it's never happened before and it's the worst time that it was in history, I, I would tell you stop being an obstructionist and either get on board or, or, or take the next exit and get the fuck out of our way. Yeah. That's what I would tell <laughs> No, I, I'm with you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up in, in the stuff we've discussed is, one, um, calling, uh, not necessarily calling, this is what I see, okay? Um, you've got large agencies, like one that I'm from, um, we won't mention. Right. Um, I'm one, one of the top 15 agencies in the nation. That's where I'm at. Uh, our ability comes through training and experience, great training, great funding. One of the most important factors backed by the citizens. Um, that that's huge. Huge. Um, huge. huge. Um, like I said, again, team effort. That's, that's what I, I, right. I propose. It cannot be, the police cannot be nodal. The citizens cannot be nodal. We cannot be in these silos. That's not the way this works. Mm -hmm. This is a team effort. The city health depends on our citizens. The city health depends on our businesses and the city health depends on our Police. Yeah. It does not depend on the politicians. Um, so with that said, um, small agencies, this is where we start to see a lot of issues. And it's not their fault. A lot less funding, a lot less experience. Because right. what I learn in two weeks of the city that I work in um, takes a year or two for a small town agency. So this is where I think you're training is very beneficial and and well, this is and coming he, from a guy who hasn't taken your training i'm just going based off my training experience and hearing how y'all right. talk I, you're I, hearing I, the right things i already know the right people. yes and so i'm but trying Eric, you actually you kind of brought up the point or you because you said your yep. agency has good uh community support so those smaller ones you it's actually sometimes can be easier for them to get local people on board because they're not fighting a big crowd or they're not True. you working with this so so that's where those those community relations those community community bonds really, really come into play. Precisely. And, and same thing with like, I mean, Greg said it, and I know you probably tell people all the time is if you go do a ride, like if you haven't done a ride along at your agency, where you live in your town right now, wherever you listen to this, I, what, what right do you really have to, to speak no out excuse. about what's going on? Like yeah. Amen. any, and any good agency will go, we would love to show you what yeah. happens on these. I mean, how many times would you love to take someone, yeah. some politician, especially by the hand and go, why don't you come on with me in midnights and I'll mm -hmm. go show you a side of the city you've never even heard of or seen before. Yeah. I mean, every cop has that. So, so yes. just do it. And people need to go do that. So I would say smaller agencies, yes, can be, but sometimes, you know, I, I, I've seen it where 
you know, if they're getting taken care of and they can they send guys to their courses and they bring it in, they know they're smaller and they have to rely on others. Everything is regional approach. You work interagency stuff all the time. Even if you're in a large city, you have a county sheriff that you've had to, or county sheriffs that you've had to uh, integrate with. You've had fed task force. You have had local exactly. partners. Like if you create, like Greg was talking about, that regional approach of this is how we're going to do this stuff in this area. And I get to know you and you get to know me. Well, now my small 12 person agency well, now we're so in good with the county sheriffs here too. We're at like 100 people now. And then actually the neighboring county has that much many more, but they kind of border us. So so now we've just increased what, what we can do. And that interaction, it's all about networking. It's all about communication. It's all about building relationships. That's everything. So I, I think sometimes the small agencies can do that, um, but you're right. They don't always have the pay and the funding to get the best training. But they have more power because yeah. there's more of them in 18,000 agencies for 330 million people in the United States. There's more of them than there are you, Eric. There's more smaller agencies than there are the big ones. And yeah, the big ones are where most of the, the training is developed or most of the money goes or most of the need is, let's say. But, but the idea is what good sheriff or chief of police in one of those smaller agencies doesn't want to go to a larger agency and, and if it's ego that's got to get out of the way and say listen we need some additional training or there's grant programs they can say we need additional funding the idea is what are you going to spend that money on when it yeah. comes right down to it listen when you bash the cops and first responders and everybody's on the pad and everybody's on the take when you're talking that kind of shit and your baby's choking what number do you dial do you go to your fucking neighbor's house? Do you go down the street until you see a, a light on and just say, well, we'll try here? Do you go to your church and ask the priest to do it? No, you dial 911 because you have faith in the system. Well, let's get it back there. Let's go back to the Heimlich maneuver and understand that that's much more important than the Gatling gun. And I'm not saying that cops uh, uh, lose focus on that, but I'm saying it's easy to lose focus on that. Every agency has an armored vehicle. How many agencies have uh, uh, DEI training? Uh, every agency has SWAT fast roping out of UH1D. How many agencies have cognitive training? And, and if you're saying, well, we have a cognitive division. Yeah, it, it, okay, I got it. So you got some PhD on call that's going to go, I, I wouldn't strangle them. No, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about changing your training to give people cognitive options so they make better decisions under stress. And, and Brian said it earlier, that's going to make you a better lover and a better cop and a better 7-Eleven clerk. So why yep. wouldn't we want to invest in that? Right. It's about, what, what, what are we doing? What are we, stupid? It's about well, making, guess, yes. making making better decisions, not about Better making, informed decisions, fast. Not, exactly. not, yep. It's not about what gear we have or what this or what protocol nope. or policy or procedure or tactic techniques or procedures because those change nope. constantly. It's how, how do I make the, the best decision right now in this moment what's you know what i mean and, that, and that's it i need the, the confidence the competence to do the i just got to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason okay that's it how do how i do that? Is that yeah like i just yeah. have to focus on what this decision has you know one of one of greg isms one of greg's quotes i use is you know every tactical decision you make creates an operational certainty and a strategic unknown so the decision you make right now here in this second could burn the fucking nation down. And you're like, oh, no way. Like, yes, and way. we've seen that. That's how many we've seen in the last 18 months? Exactly yeah. how it happens. Yeah. And so and if we know the recipe for the Molotov cocktail, we have to understand that that same recipe happens when you're in your garage fueling up your lawnmower and you're wiping your face with your shirt. Now we have all the key components. So all we need is a spark and we got a Molotov cocktail. It's just called the lawnmower. So what's the difference between the IED? We're overthinking the shit out of this. We're thinking of, uh, well, you know, the white supremacist groups in our own country and this and that. Yeah, they're all there. They've always been there. So now with the best technology in the world, find them out. But you know what? The best people in the world are the snipers. Why? Because the sniper community is put out there as our protectors, but they're not shooting people. That's not their job. They're out there gathering information. So the commander has a view on what's going on out there. The commander can't be out there on the ground. So he calls the scout snipers to say, tell me what the ground truth is. Now, if we got the ground truth, we're going to make better decisions over time. So if you're a chief of police and you're sitting in your office and you're not out there doing the pancake breakfast, you're not out there walking the 
streets and talking to your people and, and you're saying, well, that's not my job. Well, you better rewrite that fucking job description because if yeah. not, what's going to happen is going to spin out of your control quick. If you don't know how your cops are going to act, how they talk, how they dress, if you're coming across as militant and, and coming in with an armored vehicle and, and not doing that pancake breakfast with a, you know, multilingual, you know, to, to represent the people in your environment, it's easy to say, oh, it's uneducated or they're south of the tracks or it's this or that. They're your brother. They're your neighbor. They're your cousin. You live in that community. So it's it, it, you have an obligation to take that ride along and to get involved in your local police department. And if you haven't, all you've done is protest. Protest is wonderful. You've got the absolute right under the Constitution to peacefully protest. But the idea is if you're not doing something to move the dial, then you're a poser, and I'm calling you out. One of the things that I like with what I'm hearing about your training, uh, about your mindset, is – Yes, we can help police. Yes, we can help um, civilians. I I specifically mentioned I'm really excited about the domestic violence side of this um, uh, because I think the wheels are turning in my head. And we're going to pursue that after we get offline here. Um, So I'm excited about that. Um, One of the things that are also triggering in my head is being able to police the police. Now, I come from a fortunate department. We are backed by the citizens. I'll be damned if I'm going to let a cop fuck up the good stuff that I have going on. That's the attitude. Yeah. That's how you police it. So it was a real quick, I don't mean to interrupt you, but having that mindset of going, we've got something good going, because I know other agencies that I've worked with are the same thing, man. They're all like, we're not going to fuck this up. We right. have it good here. We're not some yes. of these agencies. Like, w- and, and that's what I meant by any group that does that yes. is going to be a successful group. Absolutely. And so what I'd like to grow upon, upon what I'm hearing from your training, you correct me if I'm wrong. And I'm, I, I fully admit, I understand like, you're not going to tell me like, no, it's not going to help that. But um, I do think you'll be able to articulate why it advances this point is your, your training is going to help improve the policing, the police. One of the things that I pointed out is that how do I, figure out these assholes that that they don't realize the way they're coming across. And we talked about videotaping them and all that stuff. But I think behind your training, we also are going to be able to point out like, look, here's how you're coming across. You're not fixing it. This is like, and we're talking at a recruit level. Well, now let's talk about the police level. Let's talk about ones that are already out there. I'm in the field. Like that's my, that's my role. Like I, I review body cam footage, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a higher rank now where I'm watching cops go cop. So I can start watching. I've watched many body cam videos where I'm like, Oh my God, dude, like you, you instigated this. Like you, yeah. I don't think he did it intentionally, but do has he ever been so, shown that he hasn't, that he, this is so how he's coming we, across. We, we we've had that response from people. I had specifically had that, Craig. If you remember one of the one of the Liberty courses, it was like two where the guy yeah. walked up after one of the days, and we'd always have the sidebar conversations. And he goes, literally, he said, "Holy shit!" Like I I now looking back after you explain this, like I realize like there's a whole bunch of times where I didn't know it at the time, but. I'm the one that escalated the situation that turned into a pursuit or that pissed someone off. He's I've like, done it. I, and it was, and well, and it's, it's never, and it, this is someone who's, it's clearly not their intent to You're do right. that. Right. <laughs> it's not your intent to do that, yeah. but some of the things that you do and, and, There's and that so could many come factors. from there, there, there is. And, and so you know, how you do that is just that is understanding that self-awareness, like, People can call it emotional intelligence, whatever. There's a million different terms everyone uses for, right. for what we're talking about it, and, and that's fine. We use whatever works for you, all right? But the idea is I have to understand and know where I'm at in space time, what I can and cannot do, and always, you know, at the, at the end of the day, is like, is the juice worth the squeeze? Do I have to make a decision right now? I, I've been that with, with uh, on task force before. We're like, we're going to get this guy right now. We're going to, I was like, why are we rushing why? this? And yeah, why, like, why I said, are we well, we got to do this. We got to do this. I was like, hang on. So if we sit on this for another four hours, you guys go into overtime and make time and a half pay for that time. And we, we wait it out. And he's like, well, yeah. I go, so you're telling me if we take a longer time, you make more money. Like, sounds like everyone wins in this right. situation, right? Yeah. And and I know that's being, that's way oversimplified. But the point is, it is 
you know, crime's never going away. So right. how are we going to manage it? What's the best way to manage it? What policies really work? What what's what really should we target? And and when we create a metric, because some of the problems are is how we measure success with police. It's number of arrests or this or that. It's like, well, that's not a good data point to use, right? Uh, uh, if, a, you know, sometimes, and so, yes. so we, we often look at it in the wrong way because everyone needs measurement and assessment. We got to figure out, are we being effective? Go ask the people in the community. They'll tell you, you know what I mean? And, and yeah, is that a biased opinion? Do they know everything? Nope. But that's what they feel and that's what they perceive. And that's so what that's matters. That's what it means. Yes. Exactly. That's, what, that's what it means to them. It's, it's, it's no different than someone's like, if you feel like you were wronged, you were wronged, whether or not you were. Psychologically, physiologically, sociologically, it's the same thing. The feelings I feel, whether it's true or not, if it's true to me, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I have to understand about perception. But the idea is, is what are we really trying to measure here? What are we really trying to do? Because I always go back to two, and we give the wartime examples because they're extreme cases, and it's easy to look back, and we were involved with them. So I'm not, I don't want to bash someone and think I'm, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm saying we made these mistakes. It was like the, the top uh, 100 HVI, HVT list in, in Iraq. Okay there's a hundred people that we wanted to detain or kill. They're bad dudes, right? Well, here's the thing. HVT for units, those listening is high value yeah, targets. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so as we started going down that list, guess what? It, no matter how many people we killed or captured, the list was still at a hundred. So they just added more people to the list. So now you're going down there and it's like the goat farmer who stole something from his neighbor <laughs> and they're doing a raid on, and you're like, what the hell is going on here? Like, we never hit an end point. When did yeah. we say we've met success? So uh, that part, that kind of all leads into to why and how we, we look at things sometimes. Yeah. Ever, yeah, I, I, ever, I, I, ever I, I, progressive, ever vigilant, constantly right. bettering. Yes. Yeah. But that's got to be the goal. And, and Eric, one of the things I, I can tell by your background and, and, and by the, the uh, logo art, uh, uh, you're a fan of The Simpsons. So yes. let's go back to when Homer Simpson uh, uh, had a brother. Nobody knew about his brother. And uh, so his brother ended up being a multimillionaire at the auto company. <laughs> yes. And he came up and he said, uh, what Brian just explained, I'll street for you. What Brian just explained is called confirmation bias. You see the world through your lens and you think you're the only one that has suffered this egregious con con conduct. So you see uh, uh, Herb tells uh, Homer, hey, listen, build whatever car you want, Homer, because I trust your instincts. Well, that's called fundamental attribution error. Uh, just because he's your brother doesn't mean he's got the answers. And so what he does is he goes out and he spends uh, money on a car and he puts in three cup holders and a foot warmer for your non-gas pedal foot and all this ridiculous shit that makes the car overpriced and they can't even get the enough engines and motors and electrical uh, uh, appliances to run the thing. So it runs aground and it's a beached whale. We do that every generation with our police. And, and look, uh, uh, when my time was, it was layoffs. Oh, well, we got a layoff. And what happened to crime spiked? Oh, we got to bring them back. Well, you changed the language and it wasn't layoffs. It was defund, okay? And then we're back again. Yep. If you touch the stove and you're a normal human being and the pan is hot, you'll stop touching the stove. If you're up there and you keep going, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> You know, uh, what was the guy, uh, Einstein, said, if you keep repeating the same behavior, but you're expecting a different outcome, it's your problem. Right. We are in a situation where we can make positive change in our schools, in our churches, on our streets, in our emergency rooms, with women and, and, and men that are uh, uh, being sexually abused, sexually trafficked, or uh, victims of domestic violence. Why wouldn't you want to try the cognitive solution? And your next question is, well, does it cost a lot of money? Yeah, I charge a lot of money because I'm really good at what I do. But you know what I don't do? I don't make flapjacks. Uh, I'm not a fisherman, uh, and I certainly don't paint fences. Uh, uh, so what I do, I'm the best in the world at that one thing. So you're going to get a lot of, you know, I'm going to charge you a lot of money to come in and show you this. But once you learn it, you're going to be able to paint for yourself and fish for yourself and do all those wonderful things that you want to do in your agency and, and skin it any way you want to do it. You can put whatever color on it and, and, and the, the beautiful decal and the logo art and all that other shit on it. Unlike Homer's car, this one will work when you leave the lot with it. So, so we're there to help support your training. We're not the only ones, trust me. We're the best, uh, uh, but... If your agency can't afford us, there's enough people that are out there that can band together to come to your agency. And if you're a small agency and you can't afford us, 
Tell us the next agency that can, and we'll hit them up and get you in on their training. And if you can't do that, come to Liberty University. In the fall, we're doing a free course there. You know what I'm saying? So there's always part of what we there's do that's available to you. Yeah. So don't yeah. be a classic obstructionist and go, it's just too big of a problem. We, we can't do it because that, sir, is horseshit. That's beautiful. I love it. Okay, so you got Liberty, if I remember correctly from the military, it's Virginia? Yeah, it is. Okay, it is. yeah, yeah. I Liberty would push themselves on every base I'd ever been to. So yeah. um, I just, I, I think my buddy, he was, uh, I think that's where he graduated from. I, I, I started, my bachelor's was from Park um, University, which is another very military-friendly um, uh, university. But anyway. Well, um, I got to tell you one thing, though, because, listen, uh, uh, Brian has had a tremendous amount of experience in law enforcement uh, from the training perspective, from working with organizations to build training programs specifically for their law enforcement and corrections component. Brian grew up in Chicago, uh, uh, getting a great view of law enforcement, handcuffed <laughs> and behind the screen in the scout car. So I just want to make sure that your listeners and viewers understand that he's got a tremendous amount of knowledge yeah. uh, well, when it comes to the law enforcement. The, the thing that I think that is great, and in, in this is my perspective as being being a cop for the military and a cop for uh, civilian right. world is understanding the difference in the training when it comes to just dealing with people. Um, yeah. And when we're talking about a sniper, like he has the, one of the deadliest jobs in the world. The last thing he wants to get fucked over on is killing the wrong person. So yeah. if anybody is more discriminate about who they're going to pull the trigger on and is intimate with their psychosis it's going to be a sniper and that's not something that i think is often looked at right brian, brian has killed more people than liver cancer not, and he's not, the most not together true. It's it's not true the true most, let me listening. make my point he's so, the most together humble please person stop in the saying world. that and and what he worries about is the human factor he worries about the human behavior and he worries about mitigating the situation yes. he could be a total fucking douchebag and come out here and show you his tower of power and show you all the the shots that he made and talk shit and write a book but he's not doing any of that what he's doing is every single day he's in the trenches trying to educate humans on better decision making with less violence that's an important factor yes. because there's a lot of self-proclaimed subject matter experts out there that hang up their experience and say, look at me, look at what I've done. And the ideas behind it. Yeah. I can't do the shit that you do. And I would never be able to do that. And I'm not going to invest that much money on, on guns and be afraid every time I go out of the house. So instead of that, I'm going to increase my intellect and I'm going to outthink a cunning opponent. And that's yeah. possible for everybody that's listening to what you're saying right now. Yeah. Your door just like, Kind of open. It did. It did. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm well, at the, I'm at the house. I'm in the. the I'm worried about that too because have, I think so. that's the cleaning crew. It's at the <laughs> yeah. Motel yeah, Six yeah. again, sir. Yeah. You yeah. gotta leave. This room's yeah. not rented. That's what he's hearing <laughs> in the background. Yeah, he's, um, okay, squatters' so, rights. I so, think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, we gotta do. We gotta do another show, Eric. Yes, I'm, I, I'm about tapped out. I've yeah, got yeah, a, yeah, yeah, an was, 1800 commitment, but I gotta tell you. What I love, in, and I'm being absolutely candid and transparent, what I love is your approach. And anybody that listens to your show, we're certainly going to tell everybody to listen to it. Thanks, because buddy. what I like is your approach is completely different from what we uh, had expected, even having listened to your your past broadcast. Folks, you got to tune in. you got to take a listen. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of information you can unpack here. I like it. So tell um, tell everybody that's listening from at least my side of the house, how they can find you if they want to get yeah. their law enforcement involved in y'all's training. Or like I said, I, I once we get offline here, um, yeah. I want to start getting some information to where I, I would love to connect you in one safe place together because I think you guys can save a lot, help people save their own lives when it comes to mes domestic violence. Yeah, and, and yeah. also get Brian out of that 400-square-foot Motel 6 room <laughs> that he guy. rents by the week. Is there a GoFundMe, Brian? Do you have one of those sites we can talk about? I'm, I'm down I'm down to hourly. What's with all that right bleach in the background? Motel. I just wonder so, about all that bleach uh, back there. And duct tape. I don't, I don't see. I'm not refused to answer any questions without the advice of counsel. <laughs> so I know my rights. Uh, you know, I either, love it. Or put me, arrest me or let me go, officer. Uh, right. I love so, it. All right, guys, so the, how can people the, find you? Yeah, so so obviously the Left of Greg podcast is where we talk about a lot of the stuff, different situations that occur or concepts that we see a lot. And we just do it through our lenses, and then we have casual kind of opinion-based conversations about it. Um, that's kind of the fun, goofy, we're off the wall side. Um, and then the, the, the our company, Arcadia Cognorati, I would suggest checking that out. You can always reach us on the website. I'm sure you'll put up the links and everything, and even our Instagram. So if you go to Arcadia Instagram, 
um, you're going to get a window into our training. You're going to get a little snap, but as if like you walk past a room where there was training going on, you looked in for 30 seconds, went, dang, that was, what is that? That's kind of what you get from it. But I, so I always direct people to that because they seem to be enjoying it. Um, and, and so, so there's that, but always reach out to us, go to the website, our contact info is on there. I'm Brian, Brian at Arcadia Cognorati.com. You can, you can, uh, look that up and, and, and email me there and reach out and I'll respond to you. It might take a day or two, but I respond to every single person that reaches out. And so I always try to answer any questions and then we can go from there. Greg and I can give a capability brief and talk about what we do. We have a very short, we get on a zoom call. We talk for 20 minutes. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is how we do it. And then we know then and there people are either interested or not. They usually are. So that's a good thing. Yeah. But uh, there, there, there's ways. If you just reach out to me on there, then uh, you can you can get a hold of me pretty easily. Very cool. All right, guys. Um, I will end it here. I appreciate y'all being on the show. I hope you just stand by for a second while I end this. But thank you all for being on. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for thank having you, us Thank you, Ron. Great show.